Ukraine. That's interesting. I wonder if I should change my yellow light back to blue for the Ruthos reviews. Thank you, Richard. Live, live. So I, uh, I don't talk about politics very much, but there's no country at war with Russia. Just want to make sure we're clear. There is a, there is a, there is a peaceful country that's been invaded by a unprovoked, by an aggressor, and Russia will never be able to outlive it. Amen. So I just want to make sure we're all we keep that straight. The coverage is phenomenal and if you watched any of it. The uh, that's the problem with waging a major war now. Is YouTube is live. Uh, YouTube is I live. Understand. I understand. I we'll, we'll clip it off. Thank you. And relative to what we do here, it's the cell phone videos and things like that are that are most impressive I mean, coming out of there, even live. I think the miscalculation by Russia was that the uh, was that that the broadcast that there's so much data you can't you can't control the information anymore. You can't you can't wage a war like this anymore. Like yeah, can't. China can't do it. Russia certainly can't do well, it. Well, not in another country. So anyway, I it's so anyway. I'm not going to get. I don't want to take it too far down the path, but it's. Uh, but I think that that's. I think that's a objective. statement of fact. It didn't didn't yeah. felt feel politicky. Yes, mm -hmm. but when did when did facts have anything to do with media? So anyway, so. Thank you for saying something, Rob. I was curious. If I wasn't doing all of these things, I'd be doing what yes, I usually do in these, in these kinds of things and be there. <laughs> so anyway, causing trouble with cameras. Yeah, but can you properly cuss somebody out in Russian? Like, I mean, some of those videos are just hysterical. That's right. I just want to have a whole Russian comedy skit that's now ruined. The lady with the cat. Right. That um, was a good one. All right. You still have the vampire with the, the 56K bulb. That one's still good. Yeah, we got to do, do that one. I know. We have I'm to, really looking forward no, to no, that. that. That's going to happen. It's not like it's... it's I, I, I'm going to talk to my brother about when he has time to do it because I want to use his, his Steadicam. Oh, yeah. So, that, you know, he's got a... So my brother has a... Uh, what's called a, a, Trini, a, a Trinity a Trinity rig. So it's a it's a... Very it's like expensive. Extremely <laughs> expensive. It's like the most expensive st steady cam you can have. And there's like, I don't know how, I mean, like literally when I talked, I, I was having a meeting with Ari or Ari and, and uh, or Ari. And, anyway, um, they, they knew who my brother was. <laughs> like they were like, oh, we know who that is. Cause there's like, like, I mean, there's only like 20 people that own it, you know, usually rent them. So anyway. If it goes to series, I get a writer credit. Uh, credit. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. There you go. Just Mark the date down. Business partner oh my gosh. is uh, buddies with Garrett Brown. So maybe wanna, we could talk him into coming here. I want to audition for that. It would be fun to interview Garrett. That would be, that would be, I, yeah. And I, uh, I know I, we, I've talked to him a couple times at NAB, but I haven't, uh, and uh, I have some friends that took his class. You know, he took a, he gave a class for a long time. He just invents so many things and it's not yeah. just a steady camp. I just want to audition for the word poof. 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 See? Not to, not to mention he used to do the Molson beer ads way back when. Stand by. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Office Hours. If you're awake, watching on YouTube, um, you can find out more about what we do at uh, officehours.global. First hour is general discussion about media and virtual production. Second hour is usually something we want to spend a little bit more time on. Today, we're going to have ruthless reviews where we look at our frames and talk about what's working and not working, especially as now Office Hours 2.0 
increases those requirements. And so we're going to uh, to work with that. Um, tomorrow we're going to talk about the office hours graphics and, and take a look at it and think about how we can make those better. Um, and then on uh, Thursday, we're going to talk about online concerts. Um, you know, a lot of bands are trying to figure out how to connect with their uh, with their fans. And uh, we're going to talk about that. I think we might have some special guests uh, coming to to join us to talk about concerts. Who knows a lot about online concerts? Um, and then on Friday, we have um, office hours. Uh, we're uh, we're going to just talk about how the logistics are working with Office Hours 2.0, what's working, what's not working. We'll probably do a fair number of those re right now because we're kind of in a launch cycle. Education, of course, is on Saturday. We don't put that on YouTube. And then um, we are starting our uh, Maker Bits uh, at 10 o'clock. On uh, And so um, I put uh, some links of how you can find out more about that at 10 o'clock on Saturday. And then Sunday, of course, is the uh, general uh, discussion, philosophical discussion about Office Hours and what we're doing why it's working. All right, let's jump into the questions. Bill, take it away. Absolutely. Our first one this morning comes from Chris Taylor in Carlsbad, California. He says, hosted a four-day live webinar and recorded the content. Only the attendees who paid get access to the videos. Do you have any suggestions of secure video hosting sites to help deter people from sharing access, passwords, and the like? Right, go ahead, Jason. Mm, deterring passwords is difficult. I mean, I think your, your best bet might be, depending upon how many people paid for it, um, distribute them one off and uh, just watermark their name into it. Uh, the best, the best one right now, I think, the, or the most accessible one that takes the least amount of setup is probably Vimeo. Uh, Vimeo has really worked on um, being able to provide this distribution at, uh, at, uh, effectively, and they have a variety of things. So, in addition to live streaming, they have the ability to do um, that pa that distribution for for passwords. They also have options to do OTT, so you can literally have them build channels for you for all the different uh, over the top uh, players. And so, um, they're probably the the leader at this point. Um, I have to admit that when they started it, I thought that what they're doing was crazy, but I was wrong. <laughs> it's really, they've really done a great job at uh, putting that together. Uh, next question. Next one comes to us from Simon Ray in Shrewsbury in the UK. He says, for the benefit of our graphics team and others, could Alex or someone show how to take an image into Keynote from a web page and key out the background to make graphics similar to the ones that Carl made that we all fondly remember? I am gonna, I got caught off guard here. I thought that that question was a little lower. So I'm gonna let's see if I can grab this. I mean, the, the thing that you're really um, trying to uh, get done is um, to be able to pull white from a background. And um, and so, let's see here, if I uh, just click this here, this is gonna take a little longer than I wanted it to. Um, so one thing, by the way, as you're, uh, as you're, as you're, as you're working on this, uh, is when you when you go always use if you're using Keynote always use Safari, and I'll show you why. Let's say if I want to put an Ursa into into the uh, Black Magic. So one of the things that I'll do is I will um, here. Let's jump to this. I'll cut. So if I'm if I'm looking here, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to say I, I'm going to search for my Ursa. And I'm going to click on it here, and I'm going to see these, and I'm going to go into my uh, tools and set my size to large. And now I'm looking for the angle, but I also want something that is, you know, just generally a white background. Um, so let's let's grab this one. This one this one will be a little bit more challenging because there's a little bit of a shadow here that probably won't key well. Um, but I'm looking for resolution, so this is a very high resolution one. If I look at this one here, this one you can see doesn't have that 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 um, shadow. So we might try this one, and it's uh, still a very high resolution. And what I can do is simply um, I can drag this right into Keynote. If you use um, Chrome, you will end up now. This one works because <laughs> because it's it's uh, already on white. So, but but if I switch this, let's switch this over to um, uh, I will change my theme. Uh, to, hold on, we'll change it just to black so you can get a sense of it. Okay, so now you can see the white over top of it. And um, and so what I'm going to do is I am going to, let's see if I can grab all these things correctly here. Over here, you can see that I have under image, I have instant alpha, and I'm simply going to grab this. And I'll usually go up until it starts chewing into the, into the camera. So you can see it's chewing into a little bit of that, and I might end up pulling a little bit of that there, but so it's it's kind of uh, I go as far as I can. This one had because it has highlights is a little harder, but there you go. I hit that, and now it's um 
that's over and of course black on black is going to be a little harder to see but you can see that it's pretty well separated out i might have grabbed a highlight or two here that i might have to go back to that that's particularly hard um but uh but now it over top of anything if i change any theme it's going to pop over so that's how you grab those images um you want to go and look for that that high resolution is important you know to um to find and uh that will get you those images and then you just put the text on next question Next one comes to us from Edward, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Noah Sargent in Fullerton, California. He says, when buying a new computer monitor, what color coverage do you look for? 99% sRGB and so forth. I go ahead, Jason. Um, oh boy, this is one of my favorite topics. Um, I would say at very least, uh, Dolby Vision, I want at least HDR10 plus and um, at least a thousand nits of peak brightness on anything new that I'm buying. Yeah, I have to admit for a computer, like, so what Jason says is completely accurate for mon like TVs that I get. Computer monitors can be a little bit more challenging as far as finding that and it gets really expensive quickly. Um, so for me, I either have color accurate monitors or I have computer monitors. My computer monitors are, you know, something, Bill, you got an open mic. Um, the, um, the, uh, the computer monitors, general use, I don't need to worry about color. I mean, I, I do. I mean, I use a spider to get them accurate or accurate-ish. <laughs> but but otherwise, I usually have one monitor I spend a lot of money on that's going to be the one that is going to be exactly what Jason's talking about. I want it to be super accurate. I want it to be, um, you know, have be able to support vision, uh, have, be at least a thousand nits. So I have one monitor usually floating around that looks like that. And then I have all the other monitors are the least expensive 4K <laughs> monitor I could find. And usually those are Dell 27 inches or 24 inches. Um, you know, those are the, and, and I, um, I find that they're reasonably accurate, but trying to make them all that way, um, is expensive. So can <laughs> we agree that, as many as I have. that at least, um, IPS and, um, you know, at least a hundred percent of, of P3 color is probably a good place to start. Again, for my monitors, for, for one monitor, I think that that's important for, you know, that I can check for all of my monitors. I generally, because I have too many, too, I have too many that I don't want to, for me, that would be, you know, having eight monitors all be that would, is like thousands of dollars difference, you know? And so I just look at what am I using the monitors for? Um, and then I, and then I make a decision about it and I want them to be relatively accurate, but I don't worry about them being all hundred percent. I used to, <laughs> I used to pay a lot more money for them and I just gave up because the, I, I found that I wasn't buying monitors because they were too expensive. And so then I was like, Oh, I could buy cheaper ones. Um, next question. Next one comes to us from uh, Michael Andreas in Olathe, Kansas. And uh, he says, eventual plans are to have office hours made available to broadcasters. Will any of these broadcasters require that the signal be quote broadcast legal? Go ahead, Bill. Yes, they will. They will have to at some point because broadcast legality has to do with the power and the level of signals being sent to transmitters, usually in most markets for broadcast television and for radio for that matter, the amount of power the signal is putting out can interfere if it gets over certain limits with other stations. So there are conflicts. The FCC, the Federal Communications Commission in America regulates that very tightly, which means that if you're out of spec, you can literally damage damage other people's signals. So at some point in the chain, toward the end, it's going to have to be clamped into broadcast legal specs or it will not be allowed to be broadcast. Good, Sky. Well, we have had that exact experience. And yes, the national broadcasting system in NBC clamps it at the final thing before they send something out. But they're receiving the signal from us over an iPhone. We were on a, on a TV last week in Memphis. And the one exciting thing was that the, the talent at the other end said, you have lighting. Most of the people that come in look like they're in the witness protection program. So they're getting a lot of different sources from a lot of different uh, ways. But at the very end, their responsibility at the engineering of a TV station is to, yeah, stay within those guidelines. Yeah, we. it used to be that everybody was brought, you know, uplinking or, or doing something like that. And you could do the damage from at this point, there's a lot of legalizers that, that are there that typically happen right before. So no matter what service you're using to get up, something's going to run through it. We will definitely make sure that ours is within spec because you also want control over it. It's like you don't want to have it hit a limiter you know, and just and just smack up against it. Uh, the broadcast, wh whatever we do for distribution, will will legalize it for us whether we do it or not. But if we want total control over it, we will do it ourselves. And so we, we absolutely will. Next question. Douglas Carmichael's up next. He says, what's the most common sample rate for music proje projects that aren't in 96 kilohertz? Yeah, go ahead, Courtney. Well, if they're not in 96, 48K is the most common uh, sample rate. 
441 is what you're going to end up at with, but most uh, almost all video is done with 48K uh, audio in it. So uh, I'd shoot for 48K. You go ahead, Jason. So with respect to audio only, I'd say far and away the most common way to do it. And in fact, I would say uh, arguably the best way to do it is is to conform to 441 if you are certain that you are only doing audio. Video, hands down, I completely agree with Courtney, 48K. All right, Mitchell. An alternate to 441, which happens to be the CD uh, specification, is to double it to 88.1 so that you don't have jitter and uh, aliasing issues that come up. Uh, go ahead, uh, Bill. Yeah, I'm going to support the 48 kilohertz process all the way through until the final last stage because of this. If you bring 44.1 sources into most of the nonlinear editors and you're working in video, um, you're going to get all sorts of timing anomalies. Most of the good software packages will automatically do the pull-ups and pull-down. But everybody has started, that I've seen everywhere, including music, has started working in 48 kilohertz because there's just so many uh, so much emphasis on audio for video in today's internet connected world. Yeah, the uh, forty four one causes all kinds of problems if, if you're going to have video anywhere near it. So, so like I would not. I when I when someone sends me forty four one, I immediately convert it to forty eight. Like I don't, you know, I just conform everything to forty eight um, for that or ninety six or one eighty two or three eighty four. <laughs> so if you, I, I would highly recommend doing all your work at 384, 32-bit. No, just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> that, would, that, that's, that would be out of good. I but, no, no, but, but the, um, but uh, 48 is, is what, if you're going to touch video, uh, 44.1 is a delivery format, not a work format. And so I would recommend not, not using it as a work format. Um, now next question. Noah Sargent in Fullerton, California is up again with, could you use pro pan tilt zoom cameras with Zoom's camera control? He specifically notes the Canon CRN 500, Panasonic's AWUE 150 and so forth. Or would you use another system to control remotely from another location? I think that that would be pretty, it'd be very hard to get anything good out of that. Like I think that you, you know, it would, it would be pretty clunky as far as a connection if it worked. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, one thing to consider is latency. And when you're trying to control a PTZ camera over a distant, from a distant room, uh, location, it's really hard to ease in and ease out and land in the right spot if the image that you're seeing is, you know, a quarter second or a half second behind. Uh, so it'd be better to control it from a controller that's at the same location as the PTZ camera. And, and, you know, as far as passing data, we've definitely done this over VPNs and that, that has been successful. So, you know, putting the controller on one side and, and the other part, if it's an IP based uh, control unit. Um, and then uh, the, the other thing to research is possibly some version of Streamweaver that can that wouldn't require the VPN and be able to pass that data over SRT. Um, next question. Next one comes to us from Mitchell Hill in Wilmington, Delaware on the panel here. And Mitchell says, I need a simple four foot long LED strip with a diffuser. The one that I have has a bit of video flicker. Right, go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, you can see it behind me. It's the blue strip. And if I do a close up on it, there it is. And you can see the flicker that's happening. So I'm, I need to replace that with something that won't flicker. And I don't want to go crazy with DMX and all that stuff. Yeah, go ahead, Bill. I've noticed with my lights behind me that most of them are LED based now. And if they're at anything other than 100% uh, power, they do flicker. So what I've ended up doing is moving them all to 100% and using neutral density filters when I need to knock down the brightness. Um, anything else, you're going to get all sorts of weird little flickering stuff. Yeah, I think... Uh, Cheve, I think, is the is the is the name of, that makes a lot of stuff that that are makes strips that are kind of designed for production. I think the Cheve Pro, I think that they actually are changing the intensity instead of the instead of the frequency. Um, so you may want to check that out. I go with Courtney. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Just uh, if there are GB twelve volt units, just supply twelve volts DC to the blue color, and it won't flicker. Um, you know, if it the problem is the dimmers in most of those little controllers that you have on the RGB controllers set the uh, level by doing uh, pulse width modulation, and that's what causes the uh, the flicker. Next question. Alton Christensen in New York City is up next. He says, Filmic remote app for iPad would be useful on an M1 desktop. In requesting it, Filmic responded, quote, it's something we're potentially interested in exploring and send a request so that, uh, for this so the developers know the interest. Can office hours help convince them? 
Uh, yeah. <laughs> so send us a link to where, look, bring that up tomorrow and give, make sure to provide us the link of where, um, uh, of where to go, uh, you know, exactly where we should input uh, that, that information. And we will see what we can do. Uh, next question. Douglas Carmichael is up next. He says, how do you build a super source for Blackmagic design devices and designated where, uh, designate where each subsource would be located? Go ahead, Noah. Yeah, so I can kind of take us through the three ways that I know how to do it. Um, I do want to start with a caveat that you have to make sure the switcher has super source and not every Blackmagic switcher has that. So um, let's go ahead and dive right in. So this is my current Blackmagic software. Um, it's actually going to be on this side of your panel here. You'll see a tab that says super source. Now I'm on the ASIM Mini Pro, which does not have super source. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and take us to the website. You'll see the super source control looks like this. And so to change out the sub boxes um, is going to be under these controls. So like box one would be, you know, this box, and then you would change the source. So you turn that camera to, you know, camera one, two, three, what have you. So you'll have to go through and build those out. Now, this is kind of a clunky way of doing it. And so there's been some um, extra software that you can purchase. Uh, Mix Effect Pro is kind of the most common one uh, that we see on office hours, generally speaking. But I've also seen a free product from this YouTube channel or this company called A to Z Productions. And so you can kind of check out their links and follow because uh, they basically built with uh, Stream Deck their own kind of software, which does some transitions and stuff as well. And they offer that as a free download. Yeah, and Here to Record also has some um, some great uh, software for supporting uh, super sources. I will say that um, Mix Effect Pro is literally changes the entire value proposition of your switcher um you know it's it triples or quadruples the quality of of what you do um uh, we i've used it in a lot of productions at this point and i'm super happy with it um and so it's been it's been really a great great experience for us i find myself cutting whole shows in on an ipad <laughs> you know so it's it's a uh, it's great um, next question Eduardo Augustine is up next from Panama, uh, and he says, currently using camcorders to record football games from about 50 to 70 feet away. Currently using a 35 millimeter 20X optical lens, the Sony FDR AX53. Is this a good camera for the task? Go ahead, Jeffrey. So I actually, for years, I used the step up to that. That's the AX700. It's a, that's a 12X optical zoom, uh, but very similar. It's using the X, XMAR R uh, uh, sensor inside there. So it's, it's got pretty decent light when in, in, during the day, uh, if you're doing the football game or during the evening during, uh, for a football game, and it's got great response. The only thing that I don't like about the 53 is the HDMI cable has comes from the side instead of the back, which the 700 does that go ahead jason i've been singing the praises of the ax53 for a very long time especially if you make use of that smart hot shoe and add the high-end um preamps directly into it i think it is one of the best looking least expensive 4k stabilized cameras that um that was ever made and unfortunately it, it isn't anymore <laughs> Next question. Noah Sargent is up next from Fullerton, California. He says, how is NFT, non-fungible token, to ownership and, and or copyright enforced? I go ahead, Jason. Um, it is enforced by the blockchain that um, that is created as part of the NFT. So everybody has a public and um, in cryptographically enforced record of ownership. Yeah, and, and you know, uh, NFTs, and artwork are very related to each other as far as the art world. And so when we think about how do you enforce it, I mean, there's providence that providence that you will look at and that's what the blockchain provides is to prove that something is what it says it is. But as far as counterfeiting, that is that is a problem that is as old as we are, <laughs> you know, as far as someone copying somebody else's thing. Uh, so, I mean, there's Van Gogh, there are Van Goghs and, and, and everything else that are that have all been uh, copied. You know, there's people who who counterfeit these for a living, and so it's happened for thousands of years, and uh, and so I, I imagine that NFTs will just be the same. Uh, so you'll see, you'll so I think that when people say, oh well, there's a lot of copying going on or a lot of counterfeiting, yes, there is. It always has been. <laughs> so it's just it it just hasn't escaped that. Um, next question. Matt Cool in Montreal, Canada, uh, Canada is up next. He says, what's the best way to import interlaced footage in Adobe Premiere so that we don't see the horizontal lines from any on-screen movement? Yeah, go ahead, Mitchell. Um, I, I'm sorry about that. Uh, 
the best way to do it is uh, is to go into the project panel and then right click or left click depending on what kind of computer you have and hit modify and then you want to interpret the footage and when you're interpreting you want to separate the fields uh, either up or lower depending on what type of interlace is being used and that'll turn it into a progressive uh, image and the progressive image is slightly less uh, uh, quality but um, it'll probably hang in there if it's uh, started out as good footage go ahead sky yeah the two words that that mitchell just mentioned were interlaced and progressive and that's where you you're not going to be able to import it differently because however you shot it the camera source created that as an either inter interlaced or progressive uh, format and so yes and I put the link in Mukana in Adobe, at least, of how to de-interlace something. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, the best de-interlacer is interpolate uh, between uh, one field and the next field because the fields are what's offset. And usually the cheap, uh, cheap de-interlacer filter will just take one field and double it. Uh, for the second field. So you'll end up with half the vertical resolution when you use a, a, a non-interpolating uh, conversion. I, I actually think that almost everything is non-interpolating now. <laughs> you know, so like they, what happened was is the scalers got better, you know, and so um, the first company that I know of to do this was Apple would do, um, would take, we, we took us a little while to figure this out because we were doing some experiments that iMovie, if you imported something that was interlaced, it just took one field. <laughs> it just if it was just like, I'm going to give you 30 frames a second. And we realize because what's happening, we think of them as fields, but really they're whole images. They're just every other and they and they get stretched and put together and so on and so forth. And so um, but the images, as Courtney said, are half resolution. And there was a turning point, um, maybe uh, 15, uh, 12, I think 12 years ago, maybe not quite 15 years ago, where they realized they could just take one field and the scalers would do a better job than anything they could do with deinterlacing. Um, and there was a lot of great filters that did a pretty good job of deinterlacing, but they never really got it working. Um, and um, and so when as the scaling uh, algorithms got better, they just went to just grabbing a field and throwing the other one away or, or doubling them up or whatever, as Courtney said. But I think that that's kind of transferred. Um, I don't know very many processors now that that actually deinterlace other than just scaling up one field. Um, and it's also because no one's shooting with fields anymore, or not very many. I mean, broadcast is, but that's a shrinking market. Um, next question. Douglas Carmichael's up next, and he asks, uh, the AKE, AKI, excuse me, MPC sequencer samplers extensively use a touch interface. Have you experienced a decline in productivity when using touch-centric devices in production versus button-centric? Uh, go ahead, Courtney. Well, it depends on the type of production. If you're talking about film production or something like that, where you're out in the uh, in a location, you're outside, uh, touch interfaces are quite problematic because you a, a you have to be able to see them and B, you have to be able to touch them. If you're wearing gloves, that can be a problem. If there's moisture on your fingers, that can be a problem. And you, of course, you have to look at the interface. You can't do it by looking at a meter or something else you should be looking at and just put your fingers on the buttons and know that your fingers are in the right buttons by, by the uh, tactile surface of the buttons. Yeah. Uh, go ahead, Bill. A decade ago, I'd used very few touch interfaces. I was all mouse driven and stuff like that. Starting about that time, I started switching over and with the advent of touch pads on computers and then suddenly the introduction of cell phones into the world that were all touch based, I literally don't have anything other than touch based IO stuff in my life. Um, you know, we all pinch, swipe, zoom on telephones all the time. I do exactly the same thing on my laptops now. I literally haven't had a mouse connected to my system for more than a decade. So it's just something that you have to change your thinking and stop thinking about what used to be a touch kind of thing. I understand the confusion with touch screens, and I think all of us have been in the, uh, the situation where we've been watching th content on iPads and things like that, and you get used to touch, and then suddenly you're trying to paw at your uh, laptop that doesn't have touch. There's a bridge there, but I'm kind of all touch now. The um, uh, I, we, we always see people put um, the, the ATEM interface, you know, the software interface on the touch, touch screen never works <laughs> like they're always miss hitting something like like it just it just is always like a, I, every time i see that in someone's studio build i'm like well they're gonna we'll see how long that lasts and uh because it's just because you can't feel over and grab and hit something you're, you're constantly having to look down and that's the real problem with touchscreen is that you don't know where you're at um you know just from feeling and you so see you, you're constantly 
looking down in a way that you didn't before. And so usually people move past that um, back back to hardware. And I know people who have like literally built businesses around touchscreens for audio and video and then ended up back with tactile because they couldn't um, respond as creatively and as fast. That's the real problem. In post, I think it works fine, but in live, it becomes much more hard, much more complicated. Um, as a note to our producers, our uh, our panelists are very effectively cutting through your questions. So um, it'd be good if you added, added more. Um, it, you're adding, you added enough. It's just that they're they're just crushing it. <laughs> so anyway, so all right, next question. Uh, Paul Wallace is up next from Austin, Texas. He says the SAG Awards were held in an airplane hangar. What did you think of the production values and the outcomes? Uh, go ahead, Courtney. Uh, I haven't looked at the actual broadcast but that 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 hangar in santa monica at the santa monica airport's been used as an award show uh, location for decades so they're very good at at setting it up and utilizing it as as a broadcast studio and there's a uh, very little plane traffic that takes off over the top of it so it's uh, reasonably quiet to shoot in and i think um you know ted lasso went against best comedy series of course mm -hmm. and jason sudeikis is comedy actor and uh, I think the drama series was Succession for best cast, you know, ensemble cast. That's most of the ones that I, I looked at. Good guy. I was going to say the same thing. Basically, the studio there, I mean, the, they turn that hangar. It's a classic uh, World War II right there in Santa Monica. So it's centrally located to uh, all of Los Angeles, unlike the, the Van Nuys Airport or, or even going down to Orange County where you can get the big, large spaces where people can gather. But that space is used as a a studio uh very often and it's um just beautiful location good bill yeah i thought visually everything was really it looked really good they did really good audio uh live from from the event so uh hats off uh, tip of the hat for working in an airplane hangar and getting even decent audio uh the one thing that confused me was um this new kind of weird category is squid game took so many of the awards particularly in the early part of the night and i've still not been able to get my head into the why of that but that's just me uh, but i you, i kind of watch these things and say are there trends coming up and that one is weird but that's just me next question uh moving on to stefan fischer wurzburg germany what is the best way to get audio from a mix pre 62 into a black magic 6k should i use a converter to or from line out to xlr to be able to use the xlr mini port on the black magic go ahead Noah. yeah i'd say that's a decent way to do it um if you absolutely need audio in the camera so it's synced and you're not worried about editing that in post if you're live streaming you might as well just take it both into the computer and use the mix pre as an interface which is what i do as well yeah we actually just go ahead and use the eighth inch jack you know between the two um because we're only using the audio in the camera for scratch audio so we're not we're not trying to make it work and oftentimes you know that so you just want to think about about whether you need that or or not but um but anyway yeah we we definitely don't try to do any extra conversions it's a nice simple little cable in fact it's usually in the field we'll mount that right no mount that we're using the mix pre 3 but we'll mount it right below the camera uh, next question john m gerard in berkeley california says i just wanted to comment that we need alex Lindsay's office hours around 3d printing there is so much around general help questions and many other topics like new product and printer designs and he's updating his two printers and he says there's no place to get answers i think we should basically look at maybe on our wednesdays you know our 3d you know days which we are talking about graphics right now but i think maybe add once a month we put printing in there because enough of us are i think have printers or are doing printers or interested in printers that it'd probably be worth um, you know having an hour a month that we talk about we're trying to eventually get all the all the weekdays to have their own it's almost like i, I think of it as almost like a user group that meets every month but it's in columns that are each week <laughs> so we are trying to figure that grid out and i think that 3d printing would be a very valid one of those to do at least once a month and if it got really popular and lots of people show up then we'll figure out how we do more yeah i, I think it'd be great i i think it's a really cool thing to do next question mitchell hill wilmington delaware here on the panel says i have a business class xfinity cable internet service 300 down 30 up why does my service become unstable in the morning i'm mitchell uh, usually it's pretty good, but for some reason on cable, when it's bad, it's really bad. It just drops completely out. It's not a reduction in, in um, mm -hmm. a bandwidth. It literally drops completely. Thank you, Jason. 
My first thought is that no matter how you slice it, cable is a party line. And if the the right amount of bandwidth is not being allocated to allow everyone their full amount of, uh, of up and down, you'll end up with issues like this. The other thing that comes to mind, I guess, would be that DNS is one of these things that tends to not be properly addressed by cable companies or your DNS is, is basically overused. So... Um, Last thing, get your own modem and make sure it's just a modem and then route it yourself. I'd say those three things are going to be, um, yeah, that's what hey, I Mitchell, got. Mitchell, are you using your own modem or the one that Comcast sent you? Um, I'm silly. I'm paying for the Comcast modem. Yeah. I probably should go out Stop to immediately. Right Surfboard. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead, Bill. Yeah. So I've changed. I, you know, I used to have fiber and gosh, that was wonderful. And I'm back in a circumstance where I'm on copper lines. And it just struck me as I was looking for what I could get, that they, they were very happy to promise me the highest tier service and things like that. And I've gotten close to it. But I also remember when they installed it, I walked around with the installer and that old rat's nest of uh, old cable that they're using for this old copper wiring that has splitters and all sorts of weird things in it. I just don't think the infrastructure from that last build out that they are trying now to use and sell to people for the higher speed uh, connectivity that they want in most of their residences is all that stable and working well. I mean, if I think if they test it and can get that speed, they'll market it to you. But that doesn't mean that that's really as reliable, even if it's business class. Right, go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, I got one word for you, Mitch. Squirrel. Uh, yeah, it's squirrels. <laughs> <laughs> it has to do with what Bill said. Uh, if you're in a neighborhood that has either rats or squirrels, as, as those uh, old, uh, uh, you know, uh, cables age, they love to chew on that insulation. And then in the mornings, you have morning dew if it's cool at night. And, you know, before it warms up in the morning, that moisture gets inside the cable and, and creates noise across the line, changes the impedance and, and hampers your signal. And then, uh, you know, check your cable. Or if you're if you have a situation where the cable leads to your house, to the pole is old, has been around for since cable TV started. Have the cable company replace it. You might improve your your situation Good. and shoot the squirrels. <laughs> Good, Mitchell. Good, Mitchell. You know, it's funny, uh, Courtney, you just said that because I'm looking out my window and I can see the cable um, junction box and it's sitting on the ground on the side and the cover is off of it. There you so go. It could be squirrels, it could be possums, it could be any vermin of any kind. Yeah, go ahead, uh, uh, Chris. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, somebody mentioned, uh, I think Bill said, if you know, if they can get that speed, they'll market it to you. They will sell you stuff that they know they can't give you. The, I I went with, through this last year with my modem. I bought all the stuff you guys told me to buy. None of it helped. As it turned out, it took me uh, three or four levels of escalation with Comcast before a technician came out. And he said to me flat out, he goes, they were all lying to you. There's no way you're going to get that speed in this building. They know it. We all know it. It doesn't work. It absolutely won't work. And it had to do with the fact that the apartment complex that I'm currently sitting in, it's very large. And Comcast got tons of problem calls, you know, uh, service calls on it. Comcast offered to rewire internally the entire complex. It was going to cost them a, they had set aside the money. They had a couple of million dollars set aside for rewiring the entire complex. And the board of uh, whatever the, that runs the complex said, nah, we, don't, we don't need that. We don't think we really need that. And Comcast said, no, we get calls once a week of people complaining that their internet doesn't work. No, we're good. Never mind. We don't want it. <laughs> it's Man. just an absolute nightmare. Right. It, and, and, and the thing is, is they gladly said they could give me gigabit. They right. gladly took the money and they absolutely 100% knew it wouldn't work. But I think that what they know is that it, what they want you to do is go talk to your board and, and tell them that the reason that you don't, you don't have it, because what Comcast views that as is, is the apartment complex's fault. You know, oh, like it's definitely the apartment it. complex's so, so fault. So I think Comcast's argument is they can deliver it to the corner and getting it into the, is the, com, is the complex's problem. Like, no, but, but I'm, I'm, I'm saying like that's, if you took, if, if someone took a legal view of it, they would say we're delivering that and it's not being distributed properly because the comp the complex is not being um, set up properly. Anyway, we'll keep, keep going. <laughs> but that's, that's, I'm sure that that's what the, that they would say. And it is your complex's fault. Um, <laughs> they, they need to, they need to like, I don't know. 
I would be causing a lot of trouble there. If I, would, if, if I was in that complex, there'd be a lot of people that would really be upset because the best thing to do is to organize lots of people and then focus them on somebody. <laughs> you know, and and it, it, it's, it's amazingly effective at moving things forward. I don't um, know if you realize this, but I actually spend a lot of time every day editing videos and not being a local politician. I I'm just, I'm, I'm really good at it. I'm just saying it, it, it really makes life move forward. Jason. That must be the only time I've ever heard um, ever that Comcast wanted to spend money and people were saying no, like ever in my whole life. Um, but no, um, one last thing, a good frame of reference is um, the strength of the signal can be between negative and positive 10 uh, decibels per millivolt. Ideally, you want every channel at zero. Yeah, and, and the uh, what I was going to say is I got an ERA surfboard, I think it's an SB8200, and I will say that it got a lot better for me. Like I was having all kinds of problems with Comcast, and I got the new the, the surfboard, in it, and I definitely have better service. I do need to restart my modem every once in a while to, to like reset its settings for the DOCSIS or whatever, but it's uh, it definitely was night and day. Um, from from having the modem, so it, I have a different problem. I had a different problem than Chris. Chris has a problem that his uh, management is <laughs> incompetent. <laughs> so, so. Alex, the funniest thing about the story was that um, when the final guy came out, he showed up with the big truck with the cherry picker, you know, mm -hmm. and he said, "I said, yeah, there's been three other guys here," and he goes, "Were they driving vans?" And I said, yeah. And he goes, they're idiots. They're contractors. <laughs> if if, if a guy go. shows up in a van, he said, yeah, they're an idiot. And mm. every one of them did the same thing. They came in, they cut the cable off, and they put a new right. connector on, and they did yeah. their little torque. It's like, you guys, they're idiots. Unless yeah, you get somebody in a big truck, you'll okay. never get any help. Obviously, this is a very fresh and painful situation for Chris. But the real problem is not Comcast. The problem is... is his organization management. I'm just saying, if everybody in the organization calls them once a day, they'll 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 move it. Next Send question. the big trucks. <laughs> Noah Sargent, Fullerton, California. Up next, when do you see yourself buying an 8K television, uh, Courtney? When we evolve to the point where we can resolve 8K from 10 feet away <laughs> to their eyeballs, that's when I'm going to get an 8K television. Uh, for me, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, you know, if you're uh, uh, you'll spend the money. You'll, there'll be very few things that are going to actually stream in 8K for the time being. It's an increase in bandwidth. And if you're sitting more than a, unless you've got a, a wall, you know, something the size of a wall, you know, more than 100 inches. Uh, if you're less than 100 inches, I think you're kind of wasting your money with 8K. Go ahead, Mitchell. I'm with Courtney on that because I uh, have arguments with my friend who sells uh large screen TVs at Magnolia at Best Buy. And we have this constant argument. I step back here and tell me if you can see the difference between that 4K and that 8K monster you guys just got in. And uh, you physically can't see the pitch depth, you know, at that, uh, at that, uh, at that distance. And to be honest with you, I bought a, uh, a very expensive Sony OLED uh, TV, 4K. And, you know, from a distance, it looks just as good as my uh, 2K sitting upstairs. So there you go. Good, Bill. The other thing is just the way that people consume media is changing so rapidly. I know I used to watch almost any TV that I watched on the living room television. I now watch maybe 5% of what I consume on that. We'll go out and watch a movie or maybe my wife and I will enjoy something together in an odd evening. But it's very rare now. Most of the time we're watching on either a phone or an iPad or something like that. Each of us individually with AirPods in so that we have a consistent experience that we control for ourselves. And I just think it's going to continue to migrate that way. I know my son, I don't think, has a TV anymore. And he watches everything on devices. That's just a big shift. I think it depends on how many movies you like to watch. Because, I mean, I know people watch some of that stuff. I, I will admit that my home system is, is pretty nice. And uh, I... Uh, I I watch a lot on it because I mean you can hear you can hear the audio from the street <laughs> when I turn it up. So so the um so the uh so when you have surround and a very large monitor, I don't have 8K yet, uh 4K but not 8K. Um I am looking at it, but I don't think I would buy it if I until I can afford an 85. I think I I, I don't quite agree with 100, but I think that 85 I can I when I'm in Best Buy, looking at it, uh, wondering about it, I, I feel like I can see it in the graphics. So specifically graphics where I see aliasing, but I'm super, as we've seen in other shows, I'm crazy sensitive to aliasing. <laughs> so so to me, 8K uh, has when print, when when 3D graphics pop up, it has a feeling of like paper, like, like 
absolute resolution um, that I don't see with 4K when I when I do the same thing. Um, next question. Jason Bates in Albuquerque, New Mexico here on the panel says, any suggestions for a cheap and small 8 to 16 port switch that plays nice with Dante off the shelf? Uh, go ahead, uh, Mitchell. Yeah, I'm dealing with that right now, Jason, uh, because I'm setting up a Dante network here and I bought a Netgear. Uh, it's a slightly into the business class. I'd run downstairs and get it right now, but I, I don't think you guys want to wait for me to do that. But it's a uh, eight port with uh, power over ethernet. And it also has two models of the same switch. So carefully look at that because one has got a certain amount of power. I think it's 30 watts per channel. Uh, the other one is uh, double that. Plus plus or whatever. Or, yeah, the POE yeah, plus. POE plus plus. I, yeah. I'll take a link. I, I don't need exactly the model number, but yeah. I, I, I too have a Dante network and I just don't want to conflict with it. So I want room to expand. And the biggest thing with with any of these, just we've said this before, but for I mean, Jason knows this, but uh, eco settings. You got to go into any anything that you any switch that you get. You got to get rid of all the eco settings. It's it destroys Dante's um, ability to do what it does. Uh, next question. Noah Sargent, Fullerton, uh, California, U.S. Has anyone used artificial intelligence for video upscaling? Not that I know of. <laughs> not on purpose. <laughs> I mean, there's there's some you know there's a, there's a variety of upscalers that may be using you know artificial intelligence is a little bit of a marketing term you know uh, you know you could you could also just call it an algorithm <laughs> an algorithm that, that does upscaling which would mean that all of them are using artificial intelligence. Um, go ahead, Noah. Now I've seen some really cool previews of like 1920s film and stuff that gets digitally upscaled and oh that stuff is yeah. insane. Uh, yeah, I don't know if color sometimes too. <laughs> yeah, I mean they there was there's one by a tra by a train site by a train depot and there's another one where they're where they're throwing there's a snowball fight, and it's a snowball fight I think in the twenties or in the teens or something like that and it was more than just um, um it, it it just was amazing to to look at I think there was a magical like you suddenly felt like you were there and you felt the humanity but you don't feel with the jittery you know, whatever. So what it, to, to your point though, it wasn't just upscaling the video, it was correcting, it was doing frame correction, you know, and um, I know that the other uh, person doing that is Peter Jackson did that with the World War, um, the World War One footage, uh, where they put it all back together, and then they added sound effect, you know, they added Foley and everything else back to it. But it's just there's something about it that when you see it, when it's not like this jittery, and people just kind of moving around, you suddenly feel like you're there, you know, it's amazing. Um, it is amazing. Yeah, the graphics one has some sample playing, but yeah. I had some footage from like the 1960s of my parents and grandparents and different people, and I tried to do some sort of recreation. I was able to do the stabilization part of it, but right. the upscaling and the, the color yeah. and added stuff just, yeah, it's like a portal to the past. It's kind of cool. Yeah, it's really cool. Go ahead, Sky. I, I love that train because historically you, you hear the stories of when video pro, film projection was first started, people were running out of the room because they thought the train was coming at them. Right. But uh, the, I believe Terranex was a, one of the originators of this and they were, I believe they were started by DARPA right. for the satellite imaging. And so that was the hardware solution that I used when we were going from standard def right. to high def and you needed to up res all of that to uh a, a bigger a bigger yeah. frame and in this case this is taking film that just really is is not all the frames are there you right. know and and doing so it's a, it's a yeah this is a um some deep uh deep processing go ahead because that's probably what 15 frames maybe 12 frames a second it's variable. 18 frames usually 18 yeah. and oftentimes variable because someone's going like yes only 18 but chris I will believe in artificial intelligence when Amazon stops feeding me ads for things I just purchased. Yeah, exactly. Next question. Moving on, Eduardo Augustine of Panama says, which entry-level comms tools can be used for starting video production teams? He tried Zello. He was fiddling with Discord for comms or Zoom. Not financially ready for Unity comms quite yet. Now go ahead, Sky. Again, uh, Tucker will be very financially uh, on a monthly basis, but for my Sunday morning group, we just I put a link in for Meritech. It's a three-person intercom. It feels like a little baby walkie-talkie kit, but it works great for just three people in the back of a large building trying to be quiet and talk to each other. 
Yeah, we've used a lot of different things <laughs> to make this work. Uh, so, so I think that you can. Um, I, I haven't. I'm not familiar with Skies, but there's a lot, lots of less expensive, like little wireless ones. Um, we've even used. We we got a little um, FM transmitter, <laughs> it was like a two watt FM transmitter, and we gave people like these little three dollar headsets because we didn't need them to talk back. We just needed to tell the camera operators what to do, and it worked remarkably well. Um, it was a little like, I was like, this is very, this is like 15 years ago. And we were like, this actually works. So like people can actually hear what you're saying. Um, so it, and that caught that whole system for like, it was like 20, 20 different people who had to get um, stuff. So it wasn't, it was the, the like six cameras. And then it was a whole bunch of other people that didn't have to talk to us. They just, we just need to talk to them to tell them what to do. And the whole system cost us like a Eighty dollars. <laughs> so, so it was. So it was. It was. It was. That's yeah, this, as, that's about as cheap as you can go. I wouldn't recommend it if you need to actually have you know communication back and forth. Um, but it can be done. Go ahead, Mitchell. I would uh, just an important safety notice that uh, don't use a two watt FM transmitter. Don't use a one watt FM transmitter because they're all illegal. They're not. I, I don't know if they're. They're not illegal. They don't leave the room because <laughs> they, they don't get out of the thing. Yeah, go ahead, Scott. Yeah, this this is a little Meritech that is again about five six hundred dollars, so it's still maybe a little more over your budget, but they are fairly durable and they've got the re, uh, the batteries that are rechargeable, so that they're they, they've thought this through for that market. Basically, it's a house of worship. Oftentimes, uses these. Yeah, no one cares about FM anymore. You know, the the the, the funny thing is, is that we you know like a little watt. You know, it's 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 you know like it's a one watt system won't make it out of the building. Like we've we've. Uh, we haven't, I haven't used it for 15 years, but before that we would use it for classes all the time and we'd have 50 people and we'd use, we'd, we'd keep them in there. And it was, uh, it was, it worked really well for a cost effective way to do it. And I work on some events overseas where we might have thousands of people listening to FM, um, in these little one and two Watts. And while they're not necessarily legal, they're not necessarily enforced either. <laughs> like I've never seen anybody ever tell us to stop. Uh, go ahead, Chris. Eduardo, I'll also remind you that Unity does have a web-based version that is actually quite affordable. So Unity works really great, and uh, it, you should look into the cost of the web-based version as opposed to setting up your whole server. Yeah, yeah, and and it that is really the entry level to a real comm system. Like if you're if you're going to be lower than that, things are going to be, you know, rough. Next question. Next one comes from George Butters in Halifax, Nova Scotia. He says, not everyone who tunes into office hours knows what LUTs and LUFs are. Please explain. Uh, go ahead, Josh. Yeah, so a LUT is simply an acronym that means a lookup table. So it's a simple um, measure of color grading where you have your input values and then you give a difference between your input and your output. It's used on different cameras to change the value. Um, LUFs is an audio measurement loudness unit full scale. And um, the difference is we'll use um, meters as, uh, as, we're as displayed. And the reason why you need a meter to determine this is because it's more of something that happens over time. It's the way that our human ear perceives loudness. So that's why when we're doing our voice checks, um, we'll do it over a certain period of time. So make sure that it's not just a, a spike that we're using, but the general idea of how we perceive loudness. Go ahead, Bill. It, he did a fabulous job of explaining them. Basically, the idea is that we used to have slightly different standards, but these are now the current modern standards. In the LUFS case for LUTs, um, the migration to being able to shoot in RAW and to uh, shoot with different cameras that might have different color profiles and then quickly and easily move them into one that's consistent for viewing and editing. It's technology that helps you do your job. Right, go ahead. Next question. Eduardo uh, Augustine is back from Panama. Is there an audio sync issue in the current Office Hours 2.0 stream? Yeah. One of the limitations of the new system that we've built here is that uh, before there were individual audio streams that Zoom was putting together and streaming it out. Um, and now uh, we are using a shared audio, but we all have different video inputs. Um, and so it is not as accurate. So we're basically trying to figure it out. We also have two different systems. We have go going to the the web or to our webinar and as well as to YouTube. And so we're trying to average all of those out. For some reason, this morning we had a lot of video problems before the show, which is devastating to me. Who I, I'm the one doing the sync. <laughs> so when we spend the first half hour not getting video to the to the system, the sync will be 
more off when we're, when we're trying to work on it. So for the team, it's really important that, that I get program like from 605 on. <laughs> so, so, um, so the, uh, so I wasn't, I, you know, I wasn't able to see as many people because there was a lot of black frames and screen captures and all kinds of other things. It's really important that our, our, our folks just talk to each other full screen and program gets fed into the, into the system immediately so that I can see it because I, I wasn't able to average it out. So I averaged some people out. You'll notice that some people like Mitchell and other people and probably Jeffrey are pretty close. Um, Jason was off and I couldn't fix that. Um, Fenwick was off and I couldn't fix that. You know, so I can't make adjustments. What's going to happen in the future is number one is we expect somewhere in the future we're going to get ISO feeds. So um, so when we get ISO audio from each person from Zoom ISO, um, you know, we're so we're, we're hoping to get that. And then the second thing is, is we're going to be putting a bunch of hardware and it's going to let us change the sync for every person. Um, so as we get the ISO feeds and we have ISO, we'll be able to tune the sync to every single person individually. Um, and then and then that will, um, it'll actually be tighter than your norm, you're used to seeing over it. But there, you will see some sync issues as we start to kind of, as we work through these uh, little, uh, you know, processes. Uh, go ahead, Chris. Alex, do you like seeing uh the whole panel talking or do you want to take a five or ten minute section where you just have somebody read the paper and what's important because it's a shared one what we need people to do is just talk back and forth because i need to see everybody and okay. what we're probably going to have to add in the in these early days you know again it's it's it changed radically from yesterday because there was a pipeline problem and so um so i i, I you know i needed more time than i had today um, than I had before, um, you know, in this, in this show. So, um, hopefully tomorrow we'll, the video will be on time. <laughs> and so, and then I'll be able to, um, I'll be able to figure that out. So. Maybe we could source some scripts and we could do little sketches for you. So we have a script. I could give you the script. It's, we had, we had, how, a, many, we had, how many people are in it though? See, that's the thing you need to like, you need to get like eight or 10 different people in the script. You know, we we could have people read or nine through. like this like we're seeing right now we we have a script that one of our pas wrote when we were doing uh sync checks at a at a venue and it it's a lot of p's i said i just need you to write a story that has p's in it and it's you know and and uh and he wrote this long story that's it's kind of surrealistic and uh anyway we'll we'll, we'll we might go back to that uh, go ahead uh, hasmuk yeah, maybe we need a chat manager at the beginning of the show for the first 15 minutes mm -hmm. so that we get everybody to talk and that's way yeah. we can i mean we can do that during mic checks to some degree but what we need to do is we need that video to be up and we need the program video to be absolutely working and absolutely in the webinar and and streaming to youtube um five minutes in, in like 605 we need to be working um and if that that needs to be considered an absolute thing <laughs> so so um because uh yeah, we didn't have that th today so i don't you know and then we can get once we get into mic checks i can then go through and try to correct it it was just that there was so many things happening all at one time um and that, that it's it's again we're this is all part of the launch cycle so you can expect the sync to be off the graphics to be off other things like that for the next two months <laughs> just want to manage your expectations um, alex you know, does that mean for a little while you want us to be here at like 605 uh as kind of a, a new start time it would, that it would help, but I don't, I don't want to ask the, the the panelists to get here super early. That's that, that's fine. It, it, even just some panelists here will help me triangulate this the situation. So I'm not yeah. asking them to get any. We, we went from 6:42 to 6:30, now 6:05. Before you know it, it'll be like 3 a.m. And then we <laughs> take notes, you know. So I'm not I'm not too worried about that. But okay. but we but but people should know. I made the decision that. 2.0 looks better than 1.0, even if there's little glitches. So if the sync's a little off, if the whatever, it looks so much better. And the team has done such a good job at making this work that um, I just felt like it wasn't worth continuing to try to figure this out in the back end. We just needed to go live and figure out what was going on, you know. And I still think that every day that we've done 2.0 is twice as good as 1.0 um you know and so with all the little glitches and everything else it's still a huge improvement and it's only going to get better and the best way to make it better is to be live so anyway uh, next question next question comes from george butters in halifax nova scotia during the daily behind the scenes preparation for this show you use an overlay a frame of thin lines over people's video with an oval for the panelist face what is this and why do you use it I go ahead josh yeah, so uh, we use the uh, framer uh, that helps us to see, help us to, helps us to put ourselves in the right frame. Uh, typically, this is just a rule of thirds frame where your eyes hit on the top uh, top third, your bottom third is about where your chin is, and you know we could uh, make lots of um, 
you know, one-offs, but here we like the brand thing. So this one happens to uh, share the name of our um, Chris Fenwick so that we can continue the brand and uh, to push that out. We, we like to call it the Fenwick frame because he created it. <laughs> so, so, it's so it's my brand. Yeah, yeah. I'm just like, trying to get my name said as many times as I can in a show. Like, so we call it, Chris built it. He went to the, to the time and he got it designed and we've used it and we now call it the Fenwick frame. So um, so anyway, that's the uh, that's that's the Fenwick frame. And it's very useful because it, when people can fit into that, that frame well, it means that in our super sources, everything will look the same. Um, next question. Danny Law in Malaysia is up next. As more embrace HDR monitors, how can you protect your eyes from working with such monitors as certain coated glasses alter how the colors are seen? Go ahead, Courtney. Well, Alex would be the, the expert on this more than me, but, but uh, I'd like to point out the fact that uh, you can't really use glasses to, to mitigate the problem of super high brightness of uh, bright backgrounds. Typically, if HDR is done correctly, the 100% uh, white should only show up in specular highlights and things like that. Other white should be down around 75%. So uh, if you put glasses on, of course, you know, a video image is transitory. It's changing all the time. And, you know, you'll, as I turn my head, I'll have specular highlights, things that are going to go over 100%. Um, so there's no real way to to filter that image. You can control the brightness on the monitor. You can bring the brightness of the monitor down so that if somebody makes a mistake and puts a full white white frame up there, it uh, uh, will only blind you temporarily. Uh, but uh, your eye will adjust. I can't think of it. And like you said, you don't want to put coated glasses in there because it will interfere with the you know the color temperature right. of the of the image you're seeing. Yeah, and uh, you, there is a reason that all these companies are going to dark mode. And so you'll probably see white get slowly eliminated from the web and everything else because it is uh, bad for your eyes and almost all monitors eventually will be HDR. And so um, you'll, you'll, you'll see it slowly get worked out. Um, next question. Hasmuk, our friend in South Africa, is up next with My Music Room is getting an upgrade for Dolby Atmos audio experience. What are the considerations for great acoustics and a 7.1.4 speaker system, carpets, curtains, ceiling? Uh, go ahead, Jason. Uh, Hasmuk, since you're on the panel, I, I want to ask you, is it a soundbar based system in the front? Um, what do you have in the back? Like, do you have any idea yet? No, it's a full AV processor, a Denon 6000H, and, nice. and a set of MK speakers, uh, three in front, uh, and uh, the rear, two sets rear in front, and then seven, uh, four Atmos speakers. Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, I, I would say... Um, the way that your ceiling reflects the sound is going to be your, your biggest challenge. Yeah, go ahead, Mitchell. It's all, I think the biggest challenge is where you place the actual speakers themselves. You know, if you have some kind of a grid system over your head where you can place them at the proper depth and mm -hmm. uh, distance behind you. Um, I, you know, I, I know that the, the coverings are important, but I think speaker placement is your number one priority. Yep. Yeah, go ahead, Bill. Alex will have a ton of good advice here, but mine would be simply, I would go out to some of the theaters and local places that do loud sound in a public mm -hmm. thing and just, and, and you're not trying to do it exactly like them, but notice some of the things they do. They often have interesting shapes on like sidewalls to keep reflections back. Even though it's often a big rectangular space, they do things to mitigate it being boxy. And that's one of the hardest things to do in a home residential thing. So acoustic treatments like bass traps and things like that can really improve the performance of a room. Yeah, yeah. So, so I've I've worked in a couple of spaces that are pretty good Dolby has a pretty good Dolby systems in them. And um, the main thing that almost all of them had was soft walls. So, um, so the obviously you're going to get a you're going to get a diagram that is you know going to tell you where to put those top speakers, and you have the the, the front ones and the subwoofer, and then you have your sides and your back, you know, for, for those. And those are those diagrams. You just got to follow the diagrams that are on Dolby's site. And that's going to tell you where to put those, where to put those um, speakers. The big thing is reflection. And so the best wall, the best rooms that I've been in that do Dolby um, have a soft wall. So basically they have an infrastructure here, they have um, diffusion here, and they literally have a, a uh, fabric that looks like a wall that goes across here. And so if you put your hands in the wrong place, you literally push into it and it absorbs everything, you know, and this soft wall with, diffu you know, diffusion, it's pretty much standard like Sonics or whatever, but it's hidden behind that. Um, so it'll look like a regular wall. It looks nice and clean, um, but it absorbs everything that comes into it. Um, that along with um, 
you know, good uh, sound absorbing tiles. Um, Mitchell's shown some of those in the past and then, and then carpeting. And um, that along with the 714 sounds, uh, sounds pretty good. Go ahead, Osma. Is that only the one rear wall or all, all three walls? In the rooms that I've been in that, that, that did that, it was all the walls. <laughs> like, like it was like, it just, you know, all the walls were basically three inches thick, but soft. And, uh, and that it, it, it's night and day, um, you know, as far as the quality goes. Um, next question. Um, moving on, Roger Soji in Los Angeles says, can the panelists recommend a cost-effective portable router to use for a secure Ethernet connection when streaming a live event from an A10 Mini Pro? I'll go ahead, Noah. I think what you're getting at is some sort of um, internet backup device of some sort. So I'm going to show you a couple of things that I use. Um, so I'll start with the PEP link or PEP wave. Max. And so basically you can do WAN, which is like the house internet. You can plug it up to two sources, plus it can do cellular and it bonds all that together. Now, this isn't necessarily cost uh, efficient. I bought um, one used for like 600 bucks and brand new. It's like a couple grand for these devices. I've also seen the Live View. It's a pretty popular system. Kind of same thing where it uses um, f phone cards, right? Um, SIM cards to, to help connect to the internet. And so the kind of consumer version of all this is the Video Go. Um, which is about 1600 bucks. So mm -hmm. yeah, that's what I have. Um, Jeffrey, real quick. So I use the GL iNet. This is the slate. It's uh, This is discontinued now, but they do have Wi-Fi 6 versions on that. These are great travel routers because they'll piggyback off of Wi-Fi to, uh, to, as an AP router and then work from there. I've used these in many uh, productions. They hook up, a, uh, hook up a switch to it and it works just fine. And we're gonna, uh, I think we're gonna go a little over. We'll answer some of these questions. I think that we'll just keep them pretty, uh, keep our keep our elbows in on them. Uh, next question. Joe Kidd in San Francisco in the US says, could you remind me of where we are in the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Series upgrade and release cycle? What made upgrades are on deck and release timing insights, if anybody has any, thanks. Uh, go ahead, Noah. Oh, the age old Blackmagic update question. That's oh. always on the top of my mind. So as far as the pocket goes um the 6k pro came out february 2021 so about a year ago um, i'm not really expecting anything specific around the black magic pocket line but there are some devices that have been um way past due especially the switchers high-end switchers and so we're looking towards that nab is happening april 23rd through 27th i believe so in about a month month and a half so hopefully we'll see something in that time frame yeah, I, I feel like the the Ursas are making room for another camera above them, um, but I don't. I would be surprised if the cinema changes that much. Uh, next question. Next one comes from Jason Bay, here on the panel from Albuquerque. Is there a relatively reliable way to check TAC twelve fiber without having to terminate it? I'm concerned uh, a third party installer may have been too rough on the fiber while installing it and want to spot test it. I think you can get fiber testers that don't don't require the termination. They're just going to look at the at the uh, glass itself. You just jam it in either end. Um, yeah, you put an emitter into. Yeah, you you push them in, and then you and you look at it the other way. I haven't done it, so I, I'm not certain. But I've seen people do that. Um, you know, the, the 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 thing that a lot of folks are doing. I mean, when they don't have any of the testers, they're literally don't look at it, but they they put an emitter on one end and and put the uh, and just you know see if there's light on the other end uh, to see if it's broken. If you're if you're worried about it being just um, you know where it really gets where you really have problems is when there's tight turns, when they put kinks in them. So yeah, they push it around. Concern. The problem is, is that your, some of your wavelengths will work and other ones won't. So, so that, that's where you get into trouble is that you have some wavelength. So that, and, and for that, you will need to test it and to test it fully for those wavelength um, issues. I think you're going to need to terminate it, you know, so that'll, that'll, that'll be the problem. Um, next question. Robert Soji in Los Angeles says, can panelists comment on 32 bit float recording? Uh, go ahead, uh, Courtney. Well, it uh, solves a few problems. Um, you don't have to, it, it has a dynamic range far greater than any human being on earth. And uh, so you don't have to worry about going uh, clipping. Uh, it can handle, you know, far more dBs than would be uh, cause your ears to bleed. Uh, and you can save, uh, uh, you don't have to worry about, about setting your input levels. Uh, because unless it's clipping on the way into a transformer or something on the inputs or the input stage of your preamp, uh, the recording itself will not clip. It uses 30% more uh, uh, media to record it. Uh, 
So that's great. And in post-production, then you can eliminate anything that sounded bad in the mix. Cause if it's mixed down to 24 bit, you can still get things that'll go over and will clip or will be too low. You can bring them up. Uh, and almost all 32 bit recorders have dual A to D converters. They convert the bottom, the bottom, uh, um, I don't know, 16 bits, uh, as one in, uh, one A to D converter and the second A to D converter for the top part of the dynamic range. And so there, uh, there's no chance usually that it will go over the A to D converter in, uh, and clip it. Uh, Mitchell real quick. Yeah. What Courtney said, uh, it's the lowest to the highest. Uh, to compare it to release format like a CD, that's 16 bit. So you're almost doubling. Well, you are doubling the uh, the bandwidth, the dynamic range. Go ahead, Jason. Um, Sound Devices website, which I'll put in Makana, is a wonderful resource. My favorite little bit from the page that I'll outline is compared to 24 bit wave files, the 32 bit um, floating wave has 770 decibels more headroom. That's nuts. Yeah, for some reason, what's in my head is basically that that the with uh, 32 bit, you only you still only have you know say a dynamic range of the of your uh, preamp or or what's you know might be in in some certain range, but it can sit anywhere in here, um, as far as that that goes. And so um, to to your point, uh, you know th something being really too quiet or really too too loud, you, you can't still ex exceed. A certain dynamic range all the way through, I, I believe, within the within the preamp, but it, it can sit anywhere in that area, which again means that the your perfect settings uh, don't you, you don't have to be perfect. Your 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 target is very large. Your setting is the broad side do. of a barn. Yeah, and so the main thing is is that especially for people who are not, uh, you know, if, if you're in a challenging environment, um, uh, you know, where you have to set up quickly, 32 bit gives you a lot of room for error. Um, next question. Next one comes from Terenzio in Vancouver, BC, and he says, I've started using Zoom ISO for a while now, and I'm still dealing with a lot of lag and crashing during an event and can't rely on it. Will they be launching an update soon, and can you recommend another option? I go ahead, Mitchell. Well, another option would be, are you using um, an external, uh, uh, like a deck link to get that ISO out? And mm -hmm. if you're using a uh, plug-in device, it may not be as good as using a uh, deck link with a sonnet uh, external pci mm -hmm. go jeffrey yeah i'd love to know what your hardware uh situation is i have it uh zoom iso hooked up to a uh, a mac mini m1 and uh, the 8 gig model and i've been going through stress tests uh for the last couple months and uh, i have not seen any any issue and i've even got other software that's running on there so i'd love to love to know what type of hardware what which which mac you're running this on if it's an intel mac or an m1 mac what you have plugged into it uh do you have the pluggables or do you have another dock that's plugged into it to uh, get your monitors and go from there and you can discuss this in after hours if you want to i'll, I'll be around for a little while after the show. Yeah, and go ahead, Josh. Yeah, as far as alternatives, uh, you could use Zoom Rooms. That'll give you three ISO audio and video tracks. Um, and again, what we've said too, um, the thing about uh, Zoom ISO is that it depends on your system resources as to how many tracks and what quality you're pulling out of those. Yeah, and um, we don't, yeah, we haven't seen it, that I know of, we haven't seen a ton of this. So, so I, I, we're using M1, um, Mac minis, I think with eight gigs and, um, with the, uh, duo cards and they seem to be working pretty well for outputs. Um, but yeah, if you're using less than that, you're probably going to have to use less outputs per computer and go at Hosmuk. Yeah. I would suggest coming to after hours. There are quite a few folks here who are well versed in zoom. ISO. uh, Chris has given some labs and so has Ari and Rotem. So most certainly take time out and make sure that they can understand your setup and then advise you on how best to configure it. Yeah. Very good. All right, we're gonna now change subjects and look at our uh, our ruthless reviews. Uh, we're gonna take a look at these um, and uh, take a look at everybody's uh, setup and see how they're doing. And um, we're now that we're getting kind of uh, into our, uh, uh, we now have the 2.0 up, so we can start to look at you know, what's happening there and, and trying to figure out what makes the most sense and trying to make sure that we're all synced together. So we're going to go through all of these. Uh, Sky, did you have something to say before we dive I just wanted it? to say I'm, I'm going to be the sacrificial lamb because I had a cascade of, of failures. And so this is not my optimal system, but as a piece of contrast, 
I wanted to stay on the panel to show what just a MacBook Pro could look like if, but again, it's, it's going to give you contrast to all of these other thousands of dollar cameras. Right. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, well, let's, let's just, let's just jump into it and then we'll discuss things after on the, on the other side of it. Um, I think that, uh, for, and, and for, um, I think that we'll, people can just kind of jump in here rather than trying to put their name up in the, in the thing, but I'll, I'll start. And then if anyone else wants to go, just, just jump in. Um, so, um, I think that, I think that the, I don't, I don't think I'm sold on the green light. <laughs> like, I think the green, uh, the green itself, I think is, is, uh, it's it just, um, yeah. And I think it's a little too close to the background. So it kind of has an odd shape rather than something that's kind of a, a little bit softer. Um, so I think that there's an odd shape I can see in your background. There's a little bit of something going through the green, the, the, there's, um, some stuff pushing through the screen. Um, so that, that's something that I would probably, you know, yeah, that stuff. Exactly. And then, and then there's just some, you have a little bit of a rata on your, um, on your left side, you know, that that's just, no, the other side, that right, right there. Yeah. Th there's just that, that I would either make, I'd want to know what it is or not have it in there. One or the other, you know, just as far as framing goes. Um, uh, and normally, yeah. normally my cameras, the, uh, oh, right, right. Much, so, and much closer, so yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I'm dragging. You usually don't have that, but yeah, and I think that I would try to. It's also sharper too. I would try to have. I would try to find a way to have the. Um, I think the lighting is okay. I think that the. Again, I think that the green, uh, color and shape is a little. Um, yeah, no, I, I just think it needs to be further away or more diffuse or, or something. It's just it's. It looks, it's, it uh, looks like your camera is also focusing on the microphone and not so yeah, much. It's going to be hard because he's just using a MacBook. And, you know, the, the camera stuff will be hard for him to, him to solve today. Um, yeah, I can, I can, I'll think I'm going to blow up. I think it's my J5 bridge right. blew up. Anything else that anyone else sees? It's almost like when you had that green light behind you, it was getting flagged by something. I'm not sure if it's your chair or just the light, uh, the way it projects onto the, yeah, it doesn't background. seem like it's softly going there. And yeah, if there's any way to get more distance, but you might not be able to do that. Um, you know, there you go. A little bit that, that, that That's actually, better made it better <laughs> so so that moved it from literally inches to maybe a foot away yeah and that's yeah. the that's a lazulite back there yeah but and then yeah, the, moving... the, as far as the ring light that's the only source well i do have a incandescent uh right. can light over my head the incandescent is throwing a little yeah. warmth on the background which right yeah which i can be good maybe bad i know right. And if you raise the earpieces on your glasses up a little bit, we'll not get the uh, occasional edge of your ring light in there. Yeah, but I, I think that, yeah, the, the light is a little toppy, you know, like just a little, little toppy on you. You know, you're getting a little bit of shadow in your eyes that if you, if the light came, not, not so much your forehead, it's just that your eyes are a little shadowed a little, you know, a little bit. So if, if it came down just a little bit, I think you're, the problem is you're probably struggling with uh, the, the lens reflection. So, yeah, but that, that would be the only other thing there. Let's jump to, um, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Now let's jump to Josh. Uh, I don't have anything to tell Josh. <laughs> it looks really good. <laughs> Does anyone else have any comments? I don't, I think, I think uh, it looks great I can pick on me if I, if we need to. Um, so there is a, there is an anomaly in the frame. Can you, can you spot the anomaly that I did not fix? Anomaly. Hold on. The little purple thing behind your head, no? No, that was that was that was on purpose. So, um, there's a pole that's supporting a uh, a projector screen that I need to remove. And it just different. totally because of the depth of field, it totally just blends in. That and the vertical lines in your shot, it doesn't. It looks like it belongs. Josh, yeah. we're going to have to ask you to leave the panel. That pole is unacceptable. <laughs> <laughs> Please leave right now. Uh, no, from I, I the think... last time I got a um, autofocus now, so I was right. fighting with a, a manual focus lens, and um, this one stopped down. I stopped it down to get the flavor to taste as to how mm -hmm. much bokeh to still be able to see the, the outline in the yep. background. It's down to three point two. Mm -hmm. uh, the lens goes down to one eight. It's a mm -hmm. Sony A seven yeah. three. Um, going into OBS, actually, if I go into a different thing, different uh, programs tend to give different contrast ratios. Um, I've got a, um, a key light uh, right in front. I've got a, a side light. There's a hair light. Yeah, that makes a difference. 
so it gives me a little separation in mm -hmm. the front and um, have some changes for a standing setup. But um, this is no, I just good. have to get the uh, get something to check out the HDR. But I'm not worried about. I mean, one thing I've learned is that if something looks good in SDR, it, it looks good. It, it, if something looks bad in SD, if something looks a little dark or a little desaturated in SDR, it looks really bad in HDR. Um, but I found that if it, so I, I've gotten to the point now. We did so many HDR tests that I'm pretty clear of, you know, that yours will pop out really quite nicely, <laughs> you know, in in HDR because because we're stretching the SDR uh, from that. So so I think that um, uh, no, I think it, I think it looks really good. I think that the only thing that I may guess is that if we put the Fenwick frame on, your head would be a little big in frame. I don't know if that's the case or not for sure. But uh, well, let me try it. So this I is the. I can't tell so if it's just the, my teleprompter or if it's the screen here, but, but the highlights and the lights, it looks like we lose a little detail there. I don't know if that's mm -hmm. noticeable for anybody else or just me. For the ones on the shelf? Yeah, the ones just above your head uh, to, yeah, so, to either side of you. So you're a little large in the Fenwick frame? Oh, that's a different one. The Fenwick frame is the standard. We don't know what to do with the other ones. Um, the uh, so, um, but if you look at that, you want your chin and everything else to fit inside that. You know, the head. You know, without the hair, which is fine. But but the but you want the you, you're probably just a little close to the camera. Um, you know, for when we do, you know, just and you can see it because I think mine fits pretty closely into the Fenwick frame right now, and you can see your head's just a little bit bigger. I, I, and I can't have anybody have a head bigger than my head. No, I'm just kidding. So, um, so anyway, so, um, but I, I just think it looks like a great, it's a great frame, but that'll be the one thing that we'll start to tune as we do more and more of the super sources is really trying to, in, in broadcast, someone will be sitting there with a lens going, you know, hearing some producer yell at them going, I need you to back up. I need you to go forward. But here we have to yeah. do it ourselves. I've got so, a little so. room. I can push the camera back a little bit. So yeah, I probably would just push the camera in. back just, just a little bit to, to get just mm -hmm. a slightly smaller slightly smaller frame um let's go ahead and um and jump to uh courtney courtney let's see here looks good oh dear is the light on on the trophy i don't know if it is yes it's on see i have i have the problem of uh changing a living room, room. <laughs> and the light at the time of day that we shoot this on the west coast now it's all going to change of course next week because it's going to be an hour later uh at the time uh, it starts out in darkness with a purple bluish purple background and you see the uh, lights on the awards over there but uh as the sun comes up it comes blasting through this uh, west uh, east facing window mm -hmm. uh, and it starts out very warm and as we progress it gets higher and it gets cooler because there's an awning that covers that front porch and these are french doors beside me so i can't really cover them up uh with anything that is you know completely opaque mm -hmm. as it would kill all the light in the room but um so I'm, I do have, what I do do is I have a uh, Newar light panel that is doing the fill right now. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, what I do is I, I move it further away and face it away in the morning so that right, the right, camera right. adjusts and, and, mm -hmm. and then I bring it out somewhere about halfway through the show. I, I pull it in a little closer so that it fills for the excess brightness on the side from the sun. Right. Yeah, no, I think, and, and overall, I think it, it, it's a good frame. I, I think that, again, your head might be a little large in frame as far from in comparison to the... Yeah, my mother told me that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Courtney, one thing that might help with your French doors, I don't know if you've ever seen the larger pop-ups that have translucent fabric in them, but uh, quite a few companies make them, and it, that's something that could be popped up and just leaned against the door only for while you're shooting. And then, like all pop-ups, you can put it away as soon as you're done. That would knock down and diffuse more of the French door light and probably less harsh. Yeah, it has a mini blinds on them now that are are translucent. They're not, uh, you know, they're not opaque, mm -hmm. and they're closed right now. Right. So right. this is the sunlight coming through the closed blinds. So there's no right. direct light on my face at all. It's just, except yeah, it's just up a couple of the three, probably two or three stops uh, over the rest of the ambient. So I was thinking you can get a a two stop translucent that's a pop up and just lean it against there. Might even things out perfectly. Something to think about. Although it would block the door and, and there's two there's two french doors on either side of a opaque door so i have to have two of them ah. <laughs> or get an um, eight by ten <laughs> yeah. 
wall for the whole wall. But yeah, I understand. Yeah. All right, now we're gonna um, jump to Joshua. Hi, Joshua. Hey, Alex. Hey. Just taking a look. Um, the yeah. room feels a little dark, and probably you're a little underexposed there. So um, I would worry more about exposing you more. Your key light probably could come up a little bit either closer or with a little bit more, a uh, um, little more power. So yeah, um, the separation between the beard and the uh, microphone is hard to see. Yeah, in general, I would um, with most mics, I would pull it to the side a little bit if, if it's possible, like that. Yeah, yeah. It just it's just it's a nicer frame for your for your face. Um, Got it. Should, shouldn't affect, and usually that's a better place for the mic anyway because it will you'll be speaking across it instead of straight into it. And yeah. uh, Bill, Bill, you have an open mic. Um, and the uh, the. Uh, but I think overall, I think that the, um, I would, I think that the, I think the background works well. I feel, it feels a little dark overall. And that's partly, partly was by design. So the key light, and I'm going to flip cameras, but the key light above me is actually rather bright, um, right over my head. Mm -hmm. And then I've got kind of a fill light off to the side bouncing off the wall, yep. but I've got, I'm using Filmic Pro on that iPhone and I am. I've got the ISO turned down quite a way. So if I were to, yeah, if I, I mean, were to reset the ISO, it would... are you able to, yeah, I'd, I'd bring it up just a little bit. I think it's just a, you can probably, you know, it probably doesn't have to be dramatic, but I think, and, and... what's your Let fill light right set now. to? Is it a hundred percent on your fill? Over here? No, it's turned down to 50%. Okay. But this is, um, so I'm in remote, Mm -hmm. for filmic and uh this is more like on auto yep that's that's probably closer from an overall exposure of course now the light behind you is blowing out yeah but i think that um you're closer you yeah you're closer to a full expo exposure here um, got it so might... maybe just turn this down just a little and then no i drop would turn the... i would take the the one behind you and make it lower you know, just, or Got bring it. it, I would actually take that and move it further away from the, from the wall. Like whatever you have in that light behind you, I would pull it away yeah. from the wall. I've got There's another, a, um, it's yeah, on a barn. Try, try pulling that like uh, a foot or two towards, towards you. If you can, I don't know how easy it is for you to get to that or not. It's definitely better that way. Um, it yeah. definitely gets, so you see how it's much softer there. And I might even go even a little further away from the wall there to, to just get a softer. Um... Got it. Um, okay. But yeah, but I think it's, uh, it's definitely, it's definitely getting there. Not bad with an iPhone for sure. Yeah, looks really good with an iPhone. I can't, you know, Filmic Pro and I mean, just the iPhone camera in general. Now, here you you look again like the background has a higher value than you do so something changed there is filmic pro doing any kind of auto is it on auto right now yeah at the moment it's on auto i can lock yeah. it in though yeah i would because i think that what happened there is that it it is when that got darker i think it's... does it tell you when it's in auto what i um settings it's someone's got an open to? mic like someone's breathing with an open mic, it drives me crazy. <laughs> just so, so whoever, whoever's got an open mic, just close it. That was me. Sorry. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. When you're in auto on Filmic Pro, does it tell you what ISO and shutter and all that it's setting to? No. You once you go into the um, to the manual control, it turns off auto. Okay. It's either or. Then. And okay. and it doesn't it doesn't show. Let me flip here. Um, so these are, this is what the control looks like. So if I go back to, if I go back to auto, it doesn't give me a readout for ISO. But when I go into the ISO control, it locks. And then I use the scroll wheel here to adjust. Okay. Does it have any uh, scopes on it? We we needed to have scopes yeah. in here. I apologize. We'll we'll make sure we have them all the time. There we go. So so you can see kind of in your high your white points. 
or where in the red there is could go up a little bit. Whoop. Is it go. better? Yeah. There you so go. So now, now, um, and in general, you want that. Uh, I don't know what your frame rate is that you're there, but I might move that 120 to 160. Got it. Oh. I don't know what that top number. I can't there we go. And now you're getting a little more exposure there. Um, I wonder and... if that's a variable frame rate. 23 on top is frame is that, rate. Is that the frame rate? No, the frame rate. My frame rate is 30. 30, right. Oh, yeah. okay, so good. 160 would be the natural one to, to, to put there. Um, so I can lock the 160 and then adjust the top. I'm wondering if that's gain or some version of gain. Yeah, I've never seen that. Yeah. Instead of an ISO, it's a um, number like that. So you want to keep try try opening tr just just keep opening it for a little bit. Like just keep turning it up. No, it doesn't do anything. All right. Yeah, that looks like a gain. Okay, so so pull back. And just, as you, oop, 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 oop. So you want to look at that histogram and you want to try to, especially with what we're doing, you want to get to a point where it's just about to clip. You know, it's not, but right now you got really red. <laughs> so there's something else going, there's something else moving at the same time. Do you mean reset the 160? Uh, I would definitely set, the, set that to 160, yeah. yeah there okay, we go. and so but, then I'll just adjust the top. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm not sure what we're looking at oh. there. That's, there yep. you go. Three Oof. dots on the yep. left control right under that number. What do those three dots do? Any, any, anything there? I think overall right now the exposure is pretty good. the The main thing is is that you just look red, so it's it's corrected. It's somehow done some kind of auto uh, color, so it's not it's not changing those numbers. Uh, yeah, there we go. So you might be able to move that color around a little bit to see if we can't pull a little red out of your skin. Um, let's see. It's, it's hard to tell because it's over top of your skin. Yeah. Let's see. Um, let's and see. again, one of the things to know for the folks that are that are watching is that what we'll be really sensitive to is getting enough exposure as we get the new cor color correction tools that we're going to put into office hours 2.0 exposure will be a big deal because we'll lose data color is something that we'll often tweak <laughs> you know on our end um, to kind of pull everybody together so that's something that we can actually adjust um it's good it's good no i think i think that made a big difference it definitely looks a lot more the the, the, the light behind you looks a lot softer exposure is is um, more more complete um, so I think we've made uh, made good progress. Um, let's let's jump to uh, Jason. Good good work, Joshua. Uh, Jason, we're going to jump to you. All right. So you still look a little loggy, like it's not. Are you on extended video or, or regular video? No, regular video. Um, yeah, it just looks. And are you desaturating at all in your uh, in your? No, saturation is completely flat, and um, I'm I you hope always have... days days from moving studios when everything's going to violently change maybe um, maybe maybe you just have a log complexion you know we never know like we, we might <laughs> you've be seen me in person <laughs> i know it's just, that's well that's why i'm referencing it but if you look at if you just look at you next to me for instance in the in the thing you'll see that you're you have less color and less exposure on your face you know and that's what we're going to and and that's a good example of something that when we go into hdr you'll get real dark <laughs> Like, you know, well, like it, and I don't photograph so, that way, which is the odd part. So I, yeah, I think so, maybe my no, light no, color I, is off. I think that there's something. I think there's something going on with your light, and the purple is, your, is really what is saturated. Your, what is your light temperature at? Uh, I can tell you in just are you, a second. Are you here. going incandescent or daylight in there? Uh, let's see. And I... as we as we work through all this, if you have questions about what we're doing, you can throw them into Makana if you're watching. I do have to say, your purple looks really good. I like the purple look. Yeah. I was yeah. going to say it looked a little saturated, but uh, it is super cool. So that could be part of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, your your face is a little bluish green, just a little. So I warmed it up just a little bit there. What what what's the? Uh, this is fifty two fifty. Jason, what's your light source? Your key light. Uh, I've got left and right. Um, the the real lights are in the new studio. These are um, key lights left and right in a ring light center. So are they LED or are they uh, fluorescent? LED or? with with highly diffused panels. And when are you switching to the new new space? As soon as I can. I can't wait. Mm. I get so excited that I work all day and I'm exhausted. Yeah, so yeah, hopefully the next week or two. 
I'm seeing a, a, a little bit of like optical distortion. It's something that's like stretching out your face a little bit. I don't know what it is, oh, but you it's know, weird. I you thought know. it was that green tint that, um, you know, that Mars attacks yeah. look. That's what I, was, I, what I was going for. I, I do think that your purple's clipping a little bit. So I think that the one of the Ooh, channels yeah. in your purple's clipping. It's not all of the channels that are clipping, but some of the, one of them is. Uh, it just looks like a little, it starts to flatten out a little bit. So, um, Cool. All right. Yeah. We've got to figure out, figure that out, but you consistently, whatever setting in your camera or whatever, you, you consistently are a little desaturated from what I know you to be. <laughs> so, so, um, so I think that that's, that's the thing for you to try to figure out is how to bring more color into your frame. Um, Can't wait. Yeah. It, so. it looks like the program feed also knocks down some of that purple saturation too. So that might be, you might be thinking about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, let's jump to bill. Um, and, uh, Bill, you're a little under underexposed. Um, okay. Do you, again, I've got the ATEM at, software control panel up, so do you want me to yep. do lift gamma or gain? Uh, try gamma. Gamma. Okay, so I'm on the gamma wheel, and I can – that's down. This is a little bit up. Tell me when to stop. Uh, woof, woof. Um, and then uh, – let's see. It's Maybe it's just that it's a little spotty on your face. Like as far as it just falls off quickly, um, the uh, oh, that should be two side-mounted lights right. that are. Ooh, I've got a real big delay there. Let's see here, and I'm trying to figure out. It has a little bit of a. It's always. I think it always looks a little dark. But try, try, try bringing that. Um, try grabbing your gain and just bringing that up just a little bit, and let's see what happens. Keep going. 108, 109, 110, 112, 113, 114, 115, 16, there we go. Seven, 17. Yeah. Okay. So now obviously, I mean, you might change your LUT, you might change other things in the camera, but I think that um, your face is getting closer to being properly exposed, you know, because it's it just feel it always feels like it's a little, again, when you look at um, your image compared to other people's next to next to you, it always feels a little, a little dark, you okay. know. And and now it's now, um, it also feels just a touch desaturated as well. Um, I don't know if saturation is the right the right thing to do, but well, but saturation was down at forty six percent. So let me at least get it down to zero here, or fifty percent, um, and then contrast. And yeah, we probably don't need that, but I, I agree with you. Get the face right, and then I'll go in and deal with the lighting behind me and get it back into the right range. Right. Yeah. So I think that, um, no, I, I noticed it, it went a little gray, uh, gray when you turn the contrast down. I kind of oh, contrast. The, he didn't touch the contrast. I don't think yeah, it was, I was, I was moving with saturation. I can bring it up. Ooh, I mean, that's a lot more see. saturation too much it's coming back. Oof. 64, 65%. Uh, try, try, um, 55%. Try 55% yeah. going to that now. 56, 55. There's 55. That's not bad. Um, it does feel like there's a little bit of a um, try. What what is your um, lift set to right now? Is, um, minus a one on the fur on the white, then zero zero zero. Try going to minus the. Is, I guess it's o three, right? Like it's o one. Yeah, yeah. Two o three. There's yeah. minus o three. Yeah. yeah. Alex, are you also looking at scopes? I don't have anything on. The I, I don't have scopes up. We yeah, we we needed yeah. to have scopes. I didn't realize we wouldn't have them, so we'll we'll we'll, we'll put that into our system. Um, go to point zero two. That's point zero three. We're moving to point zero two. Actuated okay. now, and that's giving me a negative zero one in red, green, and mm -hmm. blue. Yeah, the only thing it's uh, clipping is the light behind you, the practical light. Yeah, but I can mm -hmm. I can deal with all that. But your your face is actually a little bit below the normal. I mean, it's right around 70, 72. Yeah, I would um, try bringing up the gain a little bit more. Okay, we're at 1.17. I'm going to go up 8, 1.19 to 1.20. And, and I'm more looking for the look. I think that you'd probably end up fixing this in the camera, not in the not, – not just gaining up like this, but we'll mm -hmm. – um, but uh, is the app is the lens all the way open? Uh, I believe so. One uh, thirtieth plus two dB. I'm just reading the camera controls here. 
Well, well, I don't know. I can't in, get to the camera to. to right. There should be in the. You should be able to open it by grabbing that little center piece and just moving it all the way to the top. Oh, it's not all the way open then. No. There we go. So that opens it up. Yeah, you, that's you, all the way. Oh, up. now be careful because it looked like your lift changed as well. Ah. That's the problem with grabbing that. If you go to the side, it'll change the lift. So. Um, okay, so now it's all the way up. Mm -hmm. And hopefully, yeah, so negative one, we, we had uh, mm -hmm. negative two is what we want, negative O2. Okay, whoops, that's three, that's two. Whoop. Gosh, hard to get in there. There you go, negative okay. O2. It, look, it looks more natural. I like it. Yeah, yeah, I know. I think it, it definitely is more present now than it was before. So I think we've uh, definitely taken some ground. So, and we'll probably do this a little bit more often right now to, to, um, as we get ready for this, I mean, as we as we keep on expanding what we're doing, um, let's go ahead and jump. And, and I do like the background, by the way. I mean, yeah. I, I'm used to you in the this, you, know, you were in the booth for. I really know, like the background. The first 18 months of my knowing you, but to yeah. have the little archive piece and the little practical in the corner. <laughs> yeah. I, and, but it's spotlight. All of useless technology now. Yeah. Oh, it's yeah, great. Absolutely. I would love to see that with like a little bit of haze. Like I think that's a beautiful look that you get Hazer. There. Let's, let's get a hazer in there. Why don't we have a hazer? That's <laughs> a rack good. mount hazer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, hey. Because the problem is if we put a hazer and then people would, uh, someone, someone would always be yelling, play free, free bird. All right. <laughs> um, and put a little right. brown streaks and tips on that brass base on the lamp. I did. Yeah. Cut down. I'll, I'll get rid of it. I, 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 that's actually on a dimmer, so I'm okay with that. I can bring that back a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Let's look at Mitchell. Um, the uh, Mitchell looks great. I mean, it's great. It's a great frame. Um, I, I really like it. Um, like the on air. I don't think the on air is clipping. At first, I thought it was clipping, but I think, and I think when we go to the HDR, which I should have turned on today, I think we just had a couple of issues this morning. I that's got a on ND one point or point six on it. Not gonna nice. Yeah, you might be a little low in frame. I think if we applied the Fenwick frame, you might be a little large and a little low uh, in frame there. But I think that that's uh, it's pretty close. It's a good. The frame. editor's it's slouch. Good. Sky speaks of. <laughs> but I uh, no, I really like it. I think it, I think it looks good, and I know what that about we've done the it. The darkness yeah. on this side versus this this side, which is the main. I, you know key what? What really saves that darkness is the on air. You know, it would be nice to have just ever so little. Um, uh, a little bit of detail around the on air, you know, like it, it just goes to pure black. So if you had something, some kind of little light that was kind of, um, no, no, like, so under on air, the, all that area is just kind of dark. Like there's no detail. If on top of the mixer, there was like a little light that just grazed across whatever's under the on air, just a little bit of something to get, just to pull that, pull some detail out of that. It would be quite nice. Yeah, there's nothing there except a black uh, piece of rack looking at the side of it. Oh, well, then there. There you go. Um, but but maybe above where the mic is, maybe you need to. I think you just need to put there. a, I don't know why, but I keep on feeling like you need to put a Sticks logo just on the side of that. Snap on calendar. Paradise Theater. But the, I can move the Devoom there, which is <laughs> right behind me. No, no, I think I think it's good. I think it's good. I think, yeah, if there was something there below the on air that didn't go to pure black, I think it would be nice. But I think overall the frame looks really good. And I know that we've done HDR tests in the past and it, you pop out really, really nicely. So I think that's a good frame. Well, and the, the VU meters, because they're active, they draw my, my and they're also at your eye level. So they're they're drawing my attention back there, but they're not too distracting. I like them. I do I too. Like yeah. Yeah, here's, a, here's another shot of what's actually there. Right. Um, oh, and okay. when I'm wearing my earphones, the uh, the other on-air light would be on. Because because you cannot ever have too many on-air lights, apparently. Yeah, yeah the, exactly. uh, the the second on-air light, because that's a, that's a practical, really. That's your on-ear light? On-ear. Exactly. All right, let's 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 jump to, uh, good work, good work. Um, let's jump, jump to uh, Noah. Uh, Noah, I think that, you, I think you're a little close and a little large in frame. I mean, a little, little large in frame and a little low. Um, I think that that framing needs to be um, there. I think that uh, I have a file I'll send you, Noah. The, yeah, the I, have, I gotta reload frame. it here. Yeah, yeah I and can then, see um, but uh, I think that the the lighting looks really good. Uh, you could probably use just a little more exposure. Like it feels like you you could go just a little brighter, and again, that becomes ex accentuated when we go to HDR. Um, but yeah, you could probably go a little bit, either bring the light up a little bit or open the aperture just a touch. I don't know what you're using to, what, what are you, what camera are you using? 
I have this Sony FS5 with a Metabone Speed Booster and a 35 millimeter prime that can go to like a 1.0 with the booster. And what are you, what are you at right now? Uh, it's it's hidden behind my prompter. It's probably like a three three mm -hmm. two something like that. Yeah, I'd open it up a little bit. Sure. I think I think I think you'd Here benefit from it being. Yeah, go ahead and try it. All right, hold up. This is gonna be fun. This is the worst part is when people do this and suddenly the whole thing tips over and you just see this like <laughs> take going in slow motion. <laughs> Crap. Been there for sure. Hopefully that made the difference. It definitely got brighter. Yeah, absolutely. I have more, um, but if it's go a little bit more. Let's okay. let's see how far we can go. Sure. How far can we take it? Oh, where'd it go? Lens rings, come on. <laughs> there it is. What's your ISO at, Noah? Eight hundred. There we go. Okay. Yeah, let's see. Uh, ISO 800. Let's see. So it does. I'm looking at my Atomos too. I have some basic mm -hmm. scopes on it, but I probably shifted everything too. But I'll, I'll let you tell me. <laughs> you might be. You're really close to being overexposed, but I'm not sure you are. I mean, it's literally now you're much closer to kind of covering full exposure. You might be just just a you know a hair overexposed you know, at, at this point, but like a hair. I mean, we're not seeing any um, clipping in your highlights on your skin. Um, and so I think that we're we're pretty close to full exposure there. So do you have control over that stage left light? Noah? is that whatever's? Yeah, like the key? ups. Yeah, yeah. Like key light. yeah I, I can pull you back can on it just bring as that as just as a back a little bit. Yeah, not very much, but that might fix everything. Is that enough there? You think? Yeah, yeah, that looks good. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I like it. And does anyone else have any comments? I think it looks. I think it looks really good. Again, still probably just a touch close. It feels a touch close to the to the. Um, your head looks just a little bigger than everybody else's. I think Make the adjust... chroma in the red is a wee bit hot. Yeah, just it might. Little. It might be those LEDs behind me too, which mm -hmm. are uh, not the. <laughs> they're like twenty dollar LEDs, so yeah. it's not the best stuff with some indies. And then yeah, I could probably uh, adjust the focus and then basically back the mic so I can be. Yep here obviously yeah. it's out of focus right now but I'll, that's a little think, harder <laughs> yeah, you know, your eyes your eyes look great i mean yeah. they're very white and the I'd eyes pop out the, there's, there's good highlights in it uh, i'd really be nice. curious to see how the duran duran filter uh, looks but you look good there yeah yeah it's good uh it looks great well, yeah it's a really good frame yeah absolutely all right mr fenwick i think you're the last one here so, the final fenwick Look at that. He fits the Fenwick fits right into the Fenwick. It's amazing. It's like he designed it. Good mix sandwich. I feel like you could be a little more exposed. Like I feel like you're a little dark in frame. I can't hear you though. Here's what I learned. Uh at first I had everything set up in such a way that I thought looked okay. And then I just kept comparing myself to Nigel. And it was just embarrassing. <laughs> uh and I realized looks a I realized that the ISO was the thing that I didn't like in the way the 6K was, it was noisy. So I dropped my ISO down to 400 and then I, uh, the iris is at 3.5 and, uh, um, and then I adjust it, which I just copied exactly what Nigel was doing. And then I adjusted the lights until it seemed like it was okay. I've also hey, Chris, been out in the sun a bit more. There's one thing that's annoying me a little bit, and that's that it, you have kind of clamshell lighting, but from the sides going on. So I'm looking at the shadows in each of the corners of your eyes, and there's pretty deep ones in both of those. Yeah. And, and so I would split, make one of those lighter and one of those stronger. and Because right now it looks a little... Um, it's just the shadow, particularly on your right eye, is really deep. It's Well, first of all, I do have deep eyes. Second of all... Um, I'm usually angry, and so that accentuates it. <laughs> Thirdly, um, I per I played with this for a long time, and the lights are way wider than I normally would do professionally, and that's because the wall is super close, and I wanted to keep the wall dark. So I'm really, I mean, it, it, if if I'm looking at you know twelve o'clock, this is at like 
you know, 45, 46, maybe 47 on the clock. And this is at about 13 on the clock. They're wow. really wide. But the reason for that is I'm trying to flag off all of this. I can't, the other flag's not easy because I don't like the, that's how much light there is on the back wall. Totally and understand that. What kind of lights are you using? Are they soft boxes or are they some open face thing? The left one uh, is a uh, Elgato key light. And then the right one is a one foot by two foot um, Chinesium light that I bought at the beginning of the pandemic. It has a little remote and I, um, I, I'm i running everything at daylight too. The whole room is daylight. Then what could really help you there if you want to continue to keep the spill off the background, but use the Elgato key light is not physically very big. I think there are some fabric grids for it. And the fabric grids that pull out and have like an inch of depth to them are really miraculous tools in order to keep spill off of a background. So you could take that. There's no way that'll one. work. There's absolutely no, because I have, hold on. I have a tape measure here. My flag is sticking out. Ba -ba -da. 18 inches from the front of the, the key light. And, and it takes 18 inches of flag to flag that wall. If it came out one inch, it would look like that again. But, but think about it this way. The reason egg crates work is because they reduce the emitting surface from seven inches wide to literally three quarters of an inch wide, which means that every one of those egg crate grids is going to act like a mini flag flagging it off. So you get much more effective flag. Send me a link a, to the product. I'll buy okay. it. Well, fa yeah, I'll see what, uh, send, put, post the name of the Elgato light you have. I'll see if I can find one the right size. I mean, overall, it looks, the, the quality of the image looks really good. I think that, again, when you're compared to other folks, it feels a little dark, and it may be just because it's the side lighting, um, but it feels just a little cool and a little dark compared to a lot of other folks. So that's hey, Chris, to um, I found you're seeing, it, uh, What you're seeing for the coolness is Chris, the very uh, trendy ice blue background. Yeah. No, but I'm talking about the foreground. I'm talking about you look Chris, cool. Chris, I think not, not the, could, I think the whole background could, looks cool, especially the the, could, uh, uh, the doorknob. You could benefit, Chris. Uh, that helped me a lot in my image. When if you can turn the sarcasm down just a just a tad, it's stuck. Your image. I will think be the better. frame looks yeah, great, exactly. but there's this goofy guy in the middle that mm. I don't know. Anyway, and so, the third third drawer and the right. fifth drawer are not pushed all the way in on the cabinet. I doesn't want right. to pay for filters at ninety nine cents. The sarcasm. I, I, actually, <laughs> you look a little out of focus. I don't know if that's on purpose. That's interesting. You know, I was having trouble with the focus just while everybody else was going. So if I hit the little focus button on the ATEM Extreme, right, it's yeah. going to roll through the focus and allegedly find the focus. Oh, this time it did. So, and normally it does it just exactly like that. Uh, I did it like five or six times and it was absolutely falling off of focus. So I brought over the ATEM software because it has a little focusy thing and I manually pulled it in. So mm. I don't know. Mm. Yeah, it does seem like it's a little out. I would agree. Autofocus is hit or miss though. I mean, in the same way that asking a camera lens to do a video lens's job, it's just, it's never perfect. Mm. I don't right. know. The Sony does a pretty good job. Mm. Let's um let's jump to the we got a couple questions before we end the hour. Uh, let's go ahead and go to the next question. Now, and a question we have is from Robin Cutshaw in Atlanta, Georgia, and he says, "How far away are folks placing their cameras from their faces?" I go ahead, Joshua. Yeah, so again, I'm on my iPhone and I'm about two feet um, from my camera. Yeah, go ahead, uh, Mitchell. Two and a half feet, thirty-five millimeters. Yeah, go ahead, Jason. Um, much farther than that. This is an 18 or no, I'm sorry, a 24, I don't know, 18 to 24 lens. And, um, yeah, I can't even touch it. Yeah, go ahead, Noah. I'm about three and a half feet. I have a super 35 millimeter sensor with a 35 millimeter lens and a speed booster. Um, that gives you some more details of what you need. Yeah, good, Courtney. I am about 18 inches on a uh, zoom lens, and I'm not sure what it's set to. It's a 14 to 45. Good sky. Laptop coming directly out of the top of the, the machine, about two and a half feet. Good arm's length. 
1635 lens on a Blackmagic Pocket cinema, a cinema camera, 6K, and I'm probably three feet, maybe three feet, three or four inches. Yeah, yeah go ahead, Josh. 85 mil lens, six feet, soon to be seven feet. Wow, it's <laughs> a long way away. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, go ahead, Chris. 30 inches. Yeah, I'm, I'm, a, I am, um, I, I'm at three feet, eight inches away. I have a 6K with a, 30, a 24 to 70 lens that's set to 35 millimeters uh, is where I'm, where I'm at. Go ahead. Uh, oh, Chris Hardy jumped in. All right. Uh, next question. Uh, Michael Forrest in London in the UK says, is, is the eye line, chin line grid an industry standard or is it something exclusive to office hours? I can't seem to find a Fenric frame on Google. I'd like to add it to my app. <laughs> Go ahead, uh, Chris. I'm going to take this one. It is an industry standard. We started it here on office hours yeah, we, and it will be the standard from well, here on out in Chris, all you, television and film production. So you know, Michael, Michael writes shoot, you know, the shoot app and he wants to add it to the shoot. The, the, the thing, I think, I think that you should let him, you should let yeah, him. Yeah, absolutely. To add the you know, it, frame. I, I will tell you. So let me tell you You've how got to call it the Fenwick frame in the, in the app. That's yeah. so Michael, the stipulation. Oh, Michael, frame. let me tell you how this came about. So in the beginning of the pandemic, when everybody was sitting in the camera in front of their cameras and staring, you know, getting a bunch of people to, uh, to, be uniform is super hard. And so there was a lot of us, and I can go back, I think I actually deleted some. We were playing with different things. And then I wanted to, I wanted to, I'm pretty particular as an editor, I'm constantly reframing stuff. And so I wanted to sort of sell the idea to the group. And I'm, and I was playing with the lower, th with the, um, the rule of thirds. And I realized when I liked it, Right. My eye was on the third and my chin. And so I I erased a little bit of the of the stuff over there and I added eye line chin line. And then I just started using it. And then people started asking about it. And then after a few weeks, I said somebody said, Hey, can you send me that? I go, Well, I don't know if I really want to do that because I don't want to uh, perpetuate something that Alex hasn't actually approved. And so then it one morning in like the pre-show, I was like, so Alex, do you like it? He goes, yeah, I, I think I do. I go, do you think you do? Or do you, he goes, yeah, I like it. I was like, okay. And then we started using it and it just sort of took It makes on. a big difference too. Like the, like it, it really, it, having the Fenwick frame gets all of our head. When you see the super one sources the, got way better. Yeah. One of my <laughs> really main quickly. issues was I was at home on the weekend and I flicked on the show. You were live. And if you go back and look at early shows, Alex's head was about like this. And I don't know, it was super. And on a 65 or whatever TV I have in my living room, it was way too much Alex Lindsay uh, <laughs> for my living room. And so um, I was like, oh, that's that's yeah. too big. And I tried to talk to him about it and you had some excuse. I can't remember what it was. There, there was a technical issue for it. I don't remember what it was. I, I remember there was, there was like a reason that I was doing it that way. I can't remember what that reason was. I think it was yeah, before the Lazolite. I think, I think I had a smaller screen or something like that. But in post, we always talk about chewing your key. You know, if, if you're, if they're, your, your lower third is here, you're chewing your key. That's the, that's what we call it. Yeah. And, uh, and it's a hard thing to get especially new and young camera operators to frame for the edit. That's another thing they used to teach you in broadcast classes. Right. And so just having a standard and the fact that it, the fact that those two facial features, Oh, the other thing that, that, that brought it up was Jason. So Jason's got this giant, you know, vertical hairs thing era going on, kind of like uh, mm -hmm. uh, Ron Howard and uh, what's his name? What's the guy that Ron Howard works with the producer Glazer. Glazer. Yeah, Gla Glazer's got the full-on vertical hair thing. And so so people were framing hair. Like, hair is not headroom. And and I don't talk to your hair, although with with Jason, I might talk to your hair. But normally, you're not talking to the hair. You're talking to somebody's face. So the face matters much more than headroom. So what does the face consist of? Well, it's eyes and chin and nose, you know, and... Mm -hmm. Knees and toes, knees and toes. Yeah. There's so, a whole philosophy there on headroom. <laughs> but but <laughs> you talk, but you're talking about you talk to a face, and so it that's what kind of made me come up with the eyes and the chin as as yeah. anchor points. That's great, uh, Mitchell. By the way, I just want to point out we haven't done a ruthless review of you, Alex. I mean, maybe there's a little something. Please do. We'll we'll get to that. 
I want to see the um, set. This is this is rule of third, basically. And you know, I'm looking up. I know. I'm sorry about the infinity, but it's just the three the three lines going either mm -hmm. way, and it lines up this exactly with the Fenwick frame. I know what the Fenwick um, frame is. It's the circle yeah. that adds to it. Well, that's for the for the head part, yes. But it's a rule of thirds, essentially. Yeah. Alex, but, can you talk through your lighting setup and your diffusion, what you have there? Yeah, yeah, I have. Um, so I. I, my the light behind me is a mix panel 60 um, from Nanlite, and it's got a diffuser on it, and it's set to about 50% blue going up. Um, the, if you look a couple days ago, I had just put it back because I had used it for something else, and it was really bright, and I realized, what, I, what was I doing? I was like, oh, I forgot to put the diffuser back on. Something like that. So I like it to be really subtle. I like it to be like you have to kind of work it knowing that it's there. <laughs> you know, like It's not, not like something that's really light, light. It's just there. Um, uh, I have three... Um, uh, Nanlite 100s in front of me, so they're um, so they're they're pretty big sources uh, that are there. And then I have uh, one Nanlite 68 right over my uh, kind of behind me and over my head, and those aren't DMX, so they're they that's, take a little that's kind of like broadcast lighting. Mm. Yeah, I, exception, exception yeah. of needing a little of your famous forehead goo, it yeah. would be perfect. Yeah, yeah, and 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 I and I think that. I've always kind of, I mean, because we do so many interviews and a lot of our interviews all have to cut, intercut with each other, we kind of take on that kind of broadcast, big soft light in front of you, you know, that's as, that fills up as much as you can. I'm not trying to be artsy. I'm trying to be like, you you, you know, just, and, and the angle is mostly so that I get highlights, hopefully in my eyes a little bit, and that I do as best I can to, to minimize my chin. <laughs> so, so having the shadow there is part of the, is part, you know, getting that angle right is, uh, is part of that as well. So. Um, yeah, but that's that's what I have set up here, um, and then I keep on playing with this, like getting this further away because I can, you know, without noise assist, I couldn't use this mic. But it's, uh, but it, it, I still, still, I think I'm still within the range as far as volume goes. Maybe I'm a little, little low right now. Um, but the, uh, so I could probably pull it up. But I can probably, you know, again with noise assist, I can, I can actually adjust it, you know, here, and so I can make it a little louder without having to actually bring it closer without too much trouble. Um, let's go ahead and uh, jump to uh, Jason. What I love about the the Fenwick frame is that it is the embodiment of the lower third, but like any good uniform, if it's used by everybody in a panel, um, it 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 ends up just looking really sharp in the same way that a military uniform would. Um, it's yeah. Uh, go ahead, and Sky. Well, I it's it's been stated that in art basics it's yes the rule of thirds if you're not familiar with that it's been around for longer than fenwick but mm -hmm. that he put the circle in it he can put his name yeah sorry chris mm -hmm. we call it the fenwick bullseye i don't know i know Target. Fenwick, fenwick frame is good it is. fenwick frame i go it, it, it rolls off the tongue good and you'll find that many things in life you know like it was like when we when we started calling there was a lot of pushback when we started calling like the belfast method and the Mobley process and the and the the Kaheo concept and started having these names and people uh were like we should call it distributed whatever it's like welcome to marketing <laughs> like you know like if, if you work with apple long enough you realize that if you watch apple stuff a lot you know giving it a good name is is half of it like like, like maybe not, not short not maybe 10 percent, maybe 80 percent of it is a, is a good name like it was that we ended up in in a in a, a, you know some radio shows uh, you know and some coverage because of of the name like like just be clear like it's it's you know so so names are super important like giving them technical names that are accurate yeah nobody cares about that <laughs> like, like, like like you're never going to get anywhere that way like what what you know you can and, and a lot of times people have that technical name somewhere inside but that's the thing that a lot of companies don't get is i'm going to give it an accurate name that's really dry and boring and uh you know, Fenwick Frame gives it something. You can call it rule of thirds, but Fenwick Frame is, is a way better name. <laughs> I'd, I'd like to point out that, um, and this, the Fenwick Frame is not yet, but the lower Fenwick is in Urban Dictionary. We gotta get the Fenwick <laughs> Frame in there. Nice. See, soon there's gonna be a, a whole like Fenwick collection. Fenwick I mean, brand. It, how, how NFTs, we gone? I, come on. I know, I know, we still have to get the uh, the Fenwick, uh, The end. I think all the Fenwick Frames should be, uh, Fenwick, Third, the lower Fenwicks. The lower Fenwicks should be NFTs that you... So um, Vienna has an official NFT lower Fenwick. She she and Preto are the only two. I'm telling you. We're all going to be millionaires. 
I'm going to like, be a millionaire. I don't uh, know about uh, you okay. guys. I but have an original. I have an original. I think the artist dream. makes money yeah, exactly. on NFT. Yeah. yeah. Well, I have a faux okay. Fenwick. So, see that faux Fenwick is yeah. See. Uh, um, go ahead, Bill. Uh, so I was just going to say, in terms of framing, when I was learning camera work and and videography, uh, the rule of thirds used to be that you really wanted people off center. This has been an interesting evolution for my thinking because I believe that what Alex has done here, in terms of centering us all, works beautifully. In fact, amazingly well for this for this grid oriented show and from everybody's zoom expectation. I would never do this when I'm actually out shooting people because most of the time people aren't looking directly into the camera. So the traditional thing is that if you're off stage one way, you want to be looking into the frame that way. If you're off stage the other way, and those rule of third lines are for those kind of dialogue scenes traditionally. But for this, right. I think this is genius. Well, I, I didn't create this. This is broadcast television. <laughs> like, yeah. like, yeah, this is just this is how this is how you set up an insert stage. You know, insert stage is everybody centered so that they can. If, if you start moving people around, you can't put them into super sources. So, um, so the uh, so I didn't yeah I didn't make anything up. The 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 other thing though, though I do think that has changed in COVID is I see less and less interviews like this. Um, you know, and and I yeah. I, I kind of feel like it's old. Like when I see it now, I kind of go. Creed. Like it's, and, and I'm so used to, I think it's because we watch Zoom all the time and now, and because so many people have been interviewed through Zoom that you're used to them centered and looking right at the camera. And so I think that the Errol Morris, tel, you know, and Terratron look has kind of taken over. Like I don't, like it was very rare to see that. I'm, I was just watching a couple, I was watching Into the, or Into the Void uh, recently that where they're, where they're looking straight into the camera and there's all the, you know, fog of war and, you know, all those things that are, that are, that they're looking into the camera. And I, it really stuck out when they did it. And now I feel like that's what I see a lot of. And when I see them looking up to the side of the camera, like the 60 minute stuff, I feel like it's very, you know, kind of what, uh, old. What's super interesting about this framing style is it is it, I believe it derived from the fact that we were putting people on camera that couldn't look at camera. Exactly. They couldn't do it. And so, you need some, so well, you need let's to just... Nod and let's get a, a a style where i don't force you to look at a camera but mm -hmm. i just get you to talk to a person and so when you put a non-professional in front of a camera it's easier right. for them to talk to a person right. errol morris faked all that but right. yeah and that's I why agree. we as interviewers used to just be off stage a little bit they would talk to us and then the natural camera shot was their reverse right. of talking think, to us i think just what's happened is is that over COVID, because of all everybody getting interviewed through it that the that frame has changed and i just find that i i find it like i would never go back to couldn't agree more i, I don't i, I don't ever want to no, do it, an off-camera interview again and the I smartest admit, thing about the fenric frame too is that one thing i do see on zoom constantly is corporate stuff framed like this oh yeah. just all Oof. the time they put people's yeah. chin on the bottom line and if i get well uh, and again thing, again the, like the brady the, bunch didn't do it that way it worked for the brady bunch so why you know, should the, it work the the thing that i that I, I do think is that as we work through these ruthless reviews the real value for people watching and the real value for us is that we look like this in meetings too and sound like this in meetings as well and and you no one should underestimate the value of looking and sounding really good you know because i'm i didn't grow up as a you know six foot Nord, nordic model <laughs> But I feel like one when you show up on a show because you're like, you're like, you know, you're just like this giant that comes in with your with your mic and your lights and your camera and everything else. And people listen to you differently. And no, it's not fair. And no, it shouldn't be that way. But it is, you know, like, you know, and you have, uh, you know, you have more authority, you have people listening to you more clearly, you have, you know, there's just an enormous amount that gets done just around your camera and mics. And it's never been more accessible because it used to be that you had to have the right genes to to be to have people pay attention to you like that, and now you uh, you only have to have some tech <laughs> to to do that because um, you know it's so I I think that it's it's an incredible thing but you do want to tweak it it's worth for those watching it's worth getting good at this like this is this is your suit your nice car your your um you know the the things that are you know all those things that that's what this is now. Um, and, and you should definitely invest in it in that way. Um, go ahead, Jason. Now, Fenwick, if you could just find a way to get rid of those uh, extraneous Windows 10 notification noises that I keep hearing during on-screen <laughs> network <laughs> interviews there that make go. me crazy. No, what you do is you, you actually mix those into your theme music. There you go. There you go. It's a callback. Yeah, go ahead, Courtney. 
Yeah, have you noticed that 60 Minutes has gone back to live interviews and they always cut to a wide shot showing the entire lighting setup and the microphone oh, yeah. setup? And I think it's to indicate to show you that they're that far apart for COVID isolation, but uh, uh, it does establish, it does give you an establishing shot to know where the eye lines are the way they are. Right, right. No, absolutely. Uh, next question. Next question comes from Noah Sargent here on the panel. Does my headrest from the chair bother anybody? We'll go really quick since we're over time. Go ahead, Joshua. I didn't notice it until you pointed it out. And now, yes, yes, it does. <laughs> Josh. I used to have one back here, mm -hmm. two bolts gone. If you don't use it, take it off. And go ahead, Mitchell. I, I, I like it the way it is. It looks fine. When they're mm -hmm. really too big, you look like a, uh, uh, a Dr. No character. And go ahead, Bill. I just have to say the thing that drives me crazy most about people's appearances are gaming chairs. When you get that weird triangular thing with red panels on the side, I just think you're trying to take over the universe and I don't like you. Go ahead, Courtney. Uh, yeah, the only thing that bothers me about it is the moray caused by the mesh. You know, if we're solid, it'd be less of a pencil. I, I will almost always recommend not having a headrest. So, I mean, I'm just, I think it, it'll look better in frame. It, it, it is, uh, so, you know, being able to, if you can have, I preferred, I, I bought this uh, chair specifically because I knew that I could obscure almost the whole thing, you know, and it would still be comfortable. Uh, and now we'll go to the final question. Tom Ferguson, Ruthless Reviews, uh, frames per second, 29.97 or 30? Uh, Mitchell? 29.97. I run everything at 29.97. The reality is, is it doesn't matter. Like it, it wouldn't matter, you know, in, it's a zoom, it's going to be 30. Like that's, it's not thinking in 2997. So, um, so 2997 or 30 doesn't matter as you're in just a zoom, but we do run everything at 2997 because, um, 30 would be, uh, yeah. No, Sacrilege. Yeah. Cor Cor Courtney. Yeah. At 2997 and frequently, uh, they will say 30, but it'll really be 2997. And I don't know if zoom is exactly 30. I don't know how you would measure it, but, um, they may say it's 30 but it might be 29.97. It, it is. I, I'm, I'm almost certain that it, it is actually 30. I know that like with YouTube and Facebook, it's 30. Like when you I wonder if them, there's a samples. Like, I wonder if there's a samples per hour standard because this is digital and it's samples. I wonder if there's a number out there somewhere for tech people way back in the back end. They have to send a certain number of samples. Per no, hour. It, I mean, it, in reality, it's not really 30. It's somewhere between 22 and 30 is generally or 20 and 30. It's doing the best 20 and 32. Actually, it, you see it when you watch the numbers, it's doing the best it can to kind of stay in that range. So it's not really 30 anyway. It's um, more like someday. standard deviation from NTP. Yeah, but but it, yeah, it's kind of but it's kind of making its way towards it. Or maybe they want to stay at an integer rate for time code for timing purposes so that uh, when they calculate the time of a specific video, it'll come out uh, more accurately than if you use 29.9. So. When, when I talk to programmers that not, not, not at Zoom, but at other companies that do 30, uh, they were just like, we don't understand why you would do 29.97. We could just do 30. <laughs> like it was just, it was like, it was like, like, why would I do that? You know, like I can, I'm bringing this stuff in. I, why would I have some weird thing that I have to do math against when I can just do 30? You know, and so they, you know, they just kind of um, ignored it. And it was mostly programmers that don't do video and doesn't affect anything. I mean, it doesn't affect sync or, or anything else. They're just pulling to them. It's just frames and they just don't care, you know, and they um, and so that was that was the response I got was like, why bother? You know, like we're, we, it's easier to do the math on uh, 30 than it is 29. It does affect embedded time code. But they don't care because they're going to the, they're going to but they don't uh, have embedded online, time you know, code. to them. They don't. They don't, I mean, no, you're absolutely right. It's it going to it broadcast, it'll have embedded. No, but, but if you're, the, what I'm talking about is for the online things, if you're Zoom or Facebook or YouTube or whatever, they're just going into their system. They don't care about broadcast. They just care about what's going into their system. And in that case, they don't care. <laughs> they're just like, we'll just make it 30. So, um, you know, and, and if you send it 2398 or 24, it's still 30. <laughs> they just convert it. They just transcode it to 30. They're like, yeah, we're not, we're not going to do those other frame rates. So everything's 30. Uh, even 25 if you're in another country into facebook till 30 so so it's they just decided it was too too much trouble anyway thanks to our producers for uh, a lot of great questions a lot of great conversation and a great job by the producer uh, by the by the panelists today not only great frames i mean this you got to admit when we when we get a big uh panel together on a gallery you're just like wow this is the future. <laughs> like this is, you know, like everybody looks really good and sounds really good. And it's an amazing thing. A lot of great, really, really great work by the panelists in general over time. Uh, it's just been, I mean, if you go back to the early days, it's all of us have done well.
So anyway, really great work. Um, and uh, now we will jump into After Hours. <laughs> 